good morning to people online. Can you hear us online? No, we have, no we have. Good morning for everybody online. Can you hear us? Online? <coughs> yes. Can you hear us? Yes, yes I, I can hear you fine. Nothing happened? Yeah. No, yes, someone wrote yes. Yes, okay. So uh, I hope you had a good night. Thank you again for yesterday. Uh, discussions and uh, today we have a good news we are back to science um, so this uh, morning we will have the presentation of all of the projects that have been selected following the first call and before to have these presentations uh, Philip uh, will uh, talk to you uh, on our uh, project could or could take advantage of piano forte transfers activity. Uh, so, Philip, okay, you have 15 minutes. Okay, so the, the science will begin in 15 minutes. So first <laughs> and it's, it's not the same presentation as yesterday, I just forgot to change the time. Okay, so just shortly, because you know that. Um, Hear me only when I speak here. No, uh, the, the, you can walk okay. as much. Well. <laughs> so you know that in Piano Forte, we decided to uh, select uh, projects with a maximum amount of 1.5 million euro for certain topics. That means, and we knew from the beginning that we would have smaller, dedicated projects, not just one big that covers all domains. And uh, of course, that means that we would have several projects working together not working all in the same topic. So we wanted to make sure that all these projects uh, were linked together, that they are working good together. So that's why in the project in Pianoforte proposal, we introduced this task, which is task 2.2. Uh, so the scientific follow-up and integration of the research projects. So this is actually led by Stuk, by Timu Siskunen. I don't know if he's online, uh, but he couldn't come here. So I will present uh, the task that we propose here. So basically, um, we want to manage, we want to follow up, and we want to stimulate the collaboration between the different projects. So this few slides are actually messages to the project coordinators, okay, to everybody, of course, but certainly for the project coordinators, which I think are almost all here. So we want to avoid overlap and to maximize the project's impact. Um, the way we want to do it is, well, several, several things we, we plan to do. But one of the things is we also want to organize like topical workshops. So we, we know that there are different projects working in the same domain, same topic. So we want to have them bring together some of the people from the projects so that they see what the other project is doing and so that somehow there is some synergy. Uh, another thing is, um, so this is like a follow-up of the scientific process, uh, progress of the different <laughs> projects. Also important in uh, Piano Forte was that we, towards the Commission and, and in general, we wanted to capture the innovation and development and steer it towards application. So we really want the projects also, also to have an impact on the practical radiation protection. That was also one of the goals of Piano Forte. So we want them, we want to stimulate also and, and then bring the projects together so that, are, that they go towards applications and recommendations. Um, Finally, also important was that there was particular attention to be given to the integration of social sciences and humanities in the funded projects. Already for the call text, uh, we prepared uh, a guide for how to integrate social sciences in your projects. So we will try to stimulate this and, and continue this uh, in the projects that exist. So some examples that uh, people could try to work together. Really, so like. This was already mentioned yesterday for training activities. Um, on one hand, there is, and that was also mentioned before, uh, during the call, so there is money in Piano Forte to organize training activities. So the project coordinators, or the people from the projects, they can apply for funding next to their project to organize training activities. And again, we would like, sometimes it can be very useful to have a dedicated training activity on some topic, but if there's five projects working on the medical topics, 
maybe they can work together and organize one training course which covers different aspects which are covered in different projects. So we want to see how they can work together. Um, infrastructure into comparison, so this is with Work Package 5. Also, there are different actions and it would be beneficial if um, we know what kind of infrastructures this project will use, how they can use the support from Work Package 5. So Liz, Liz is in the back there, <laughs> so she will help with this. And um, yeah, also maybe there are point of comparisons that are needed that can be done together with the whole community. So work together with Work Package 5 is one thing. Workshops, uh, I remember in concerts, the different projects were, in my opinion, quite successful. But I remember they all had their own workshop at the end of the project. And sometimes there were like 10 people, three people in some of these workshops, which of course was not very uh, efficient. So also here, let's check if it's useful to do a workshop together at the end of the project. Um, stakeholder engagement plan also already yesterday's work package three. Uh, Florian is there. Uh, so also there. <coughs> Maybe it's useful to have some specific stakeholder input in some of the projects that are not covered at the moment, but there is a stakeholder advisory board. Maybe you can use this one to start or align the different activities that are planned within work package three. Um, and of course, coordinate dissemination strategy and website. Also, Marie is sitting there, just pointing to the people. There are some new people I know, and they, they might not know them. Uh, so, yeah, dissemination strategy, website. It could be useful to use the website from Piano Forte and not build your own website somewhere, somewhere else. So these things are some examples of plans that we have. We'll see. I hope it will work. I think so. At the moment, there will be nine projects. Next year, there will be nine extra, so then there will be 18 and then another, so and then uh, it will be become a more and more difficult task, but we will start with these nine projects to see how we can bring them together. So the first task we have is to know, at the moment, we know from most of the projects, we know the title, we know the name of the coordinator, so we will see this morning now what they plan to do, uh, but we want to uh, set up a dialogue with the project coordinators and see what the plans are, and then through these topical workshops, which will be online, we can see how we can link them up and put them together. Um, <clears throat> okay, this is what you tell it. So we have this, we plan this topical workshops while the project starts. We, uh, there is this guide for integration of uh, social sciences, so this we can promote again to the project. Analyze overlapping of similar actions that we see in the project plans, if they plan to do something similar. It's the task of 2.3 to, to capture this and to point this out. And the first step, uh, we have prepared, uh, people from Bulgaria have prepared an online questionnaire. And this is the first thing that will be distributed once the project started. So we try to make, it's quite a long questionnaire, but it's just to capture all these different things. So that is ready. And uh, okay, so this will be the first step that we will send you a questionnaire. So some general in information, main expected results of the research project. How do you plan to disseminate? What is your impact? Interaction with other projects and initiatives that you have already foreseen. How will you do the integration of social sciences? And how will you do uh, recommendation forming? So that's part of the things that are in the questionnaire for now. That's it. So it's very, yes. But the, uh, can we use like for answering basically stuff that we have written down in the, in the project? Sure, 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 sure. Of course. Because I mean, we basically provided. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But the thing is, at the moment, we don't know, and you don't know about it. So we want to have a kind of structured overview on the important things where we want to link. <laughs> Just an extraction. The, the, the questionnaire is long. And will that make the um, available? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, and the idea is then um, if we see that there are some activities in, let's say, Work Package 4 in some project, please point a contact person from the project so we can bring them together with the Work Package leaders. So we have to start and we will adjust during the process. This will be the first exercise that we do like this. But we thought it was not bad to, instead of start reading all these questions, all the project proposals, we have a questionnaire and then they put the important things there. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Lisa. 
just, just came, so it's really good you're pointing out. I'm Liz, I'm leading on the infrastructure tax. Um, and a couple of things. So, project you, you should have written in your proposal about a data management plan. We are expecting you to adhere to the data management plan as produced by work package five. So, please get in contact with us and we can help you with that. And then I mentioned yesterday we're going to have a workshop on infrastructures on the 29th and 30th of January. Um, we are very much hoping that project leads or, or at least nominated individuals from the projects will attend that workshop. There should be at least some hybrid elements, but we might need to go in person if possible to, um, you know, as, as we said, we want to work together as all of the projects and all of these integration activities. So uh, don't forget about infrastructure stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. No more questions? <coughs> okay, so let's start with the presentation of the project. And uh, Simonetta will uh, start with the uh, project uh, on uh, Discover project. So you are going to explain us what you plan to do. So good morning, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. And I will give you just an overview of the project. And uh, the title is setting radiation effect into the cerebellum microenvironment driving tumor promotion. Uh, the proposal has been uh, submitted to topic number one, uh, developing knowledge um, base for a better understanding of disease pathogenics on ionizing, ionizing radiation in this cancer to improve human health risk. The duration of the project is 36 months. And the budget is a little bit below 1 million, so it's 1,344,970 uh, euros. <coughs> and uh, beside an ad that is the coordinator, we have uh, partner number one is the Federal Office for Radiation Protection, DFS. Partner number two is the National Public Health Center in Budapest. And then we have uh, a sub subcontractor of INEA, that is Oxford Brooks University. This is an all female team. We have uh, Simone Morto from the FS, uh, Kadalin Luminsky from NK, and uh, Munira Kadim for Oxford Brooks University. Now, the goal of this cover, radiation carcinogenesis is classically attributed to unrepaired or misrepaired DNA damage. However, there is increasing recognition that radiation can induce changes within the microenvironment and cause epigenetic modifications. Now, do radiation induced modification in the microenvironment contribute to cancer development? Within this project, we will seek an answer for this question. DISCOVER is a multifaceted research proposal focusing on the fact of ionizing radiation on the cell microenvironment communication and its role in tumor development. The integration of highly innovative approaches and comparisons with human data aims to significantly advance mechanistic understanding of radiation in this cancer and its potential implication for risk assessment and personalized medicine. Uh, the experimental model we are going to use is represented for um, from medulloblastoma developed in patch that zygous mice. Medulloblastoma is the most common malignant pediatric brain tumor. It arises from mutated granule cell cultures or the transit population of progenitors that normal condition give rise to granule neurons of the cerebellum. Patch heterozygous mice has uh, carry an inactivated copy of the patch gene, and among many other pathology, they are predisposed to tumor development and also medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma can also be induced in these mice by neonatal exposure to ionizing radiation, even at very low doses. In discovery, we aim to understand how the different population of the cerebellum, such as granule cell precursor, that are the medulloblastoma cell of origin, but also other components 
of the microbial environment, such as astrocytes, microglia, and the ileal style macrophage, for instance, respond to exposure to a moderate dose of 2 gray or to a low dose of 0.1 gray of X rays and uh, cooperate to tumor formation, tumor gibesis. The technological approach we are going to use are, let's say, the combination uh, of the knowledge and skill from different areas, such as in vivo radiation carcinogenesis, but also chronics. We are going to investigate extravesical cargo, mirnon, uh, genome methylation. We are going to use single cells as ketonic and proteome. And through bioinformatic and system biology, we, we identify pathway involved in radiation tumor genesis. Mm -hmm. Uh, for in this proposal, NL will focus on experimental model, mirnome analysis, and single cell transcriptonic. For BFS, that will be dedicated to secretome, proteome, methylation, and bioinformatic analysis. And then K will take care of nerve inflammation, angiogenesis, and integrative analysis. And the OBO will take care of exosome profile uh, of not of note, extracellular vesicle is a common ground for all departments. The expertise of the part of departments complement each other very well and aligns with the proposed project. Mm. The major question, as I said, is to distinguish the radiation effect in tumor initiating cells and in the macro environment. To this aim, we will use a model system of different complexity. Uh, we will have radiation carcinogenesis in vivo, but also organotypic cerebellar slides, and of course, ex vivo and in vitro cerebellar cell culture. We will investigate extracellular vesicle cargo and secret of analysis to find out the mediators of radiation carcinogenesis. And finally, we will perform in vivo functional tests of extracellular vesicle and relevant pathways to validate their potential role in radiation carcinogenesis. This is the per chart of the project. We have five experimental work packages. Uh, work package one, investigating changes in the cerebellum microenvironment in vivo. Work package two, dissecting radiation effects in medulloblastoma precursors and cerebellum microenvironment in vitro. Work package three, dissecting the impact of radiation effects on granule cell precursors and dye microenvironment ex vivo. Then we have work package four, extracellular vesicle omic analysis. And five, functional tests of extracellular vesicle and other relevant pathways. Plus we have work package six, that is project management and WP7 training, dissemination and exploitation. Just a summary of the specific aim to this step microenvironment contribution driving tumorigenesis to use of model system of different complexity in vitro, ex vivo and in vivo models to understand the intricate interaction in radiation induced tumorigenesis to undertake a comparative analysis of transcriptomic profiles at the individual cell level to examine radiation effects and gene expression of cerebellum in vivo, to investigate tiretone extracellular vesicle and epigenetic changes as possible mediators of microenvironment signaling by integrating information coming from different model systems, to perform omics on extracellular uh, extracellular vesicle cargo and integrative analysis to identify microenvironment signaling pathway, to use integrative bioinformatic analysis to identify pathways affected in cell and brains and potentially biological mechanism and exposure, and finally to perform, as I said, functional tests mm -hmm. in vivo. Uh, understanding the mechanism of complex processes involved in radiation induced carcinogenesis is a key element of risk assessment in radiation protection. And uh, with this, I thank you, and I hope it has been clear enough to give you the message.
Thank you very much, Simoneta, for your presentation. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. It's a very great presentation. Um, the only question I got is the timing when you're going to look because you're doing that on sales on Organo, but it's not at all the same uh, time frame that you're making people. So, and you know that the secretion of the, the factor can be modulated in function of time. We have uh, been working with uh, extracellular vesicles in vivo, also in a previous project that has been separate. So, in that project, we use uh, uh, 15 days, and uh, if I'm not wrong, but we will try several times, not just, just one point. So, you will do long term these? No, 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 not one term, short term, but uh, if I if don't recall, you to the we can speak about it. Yeah, okay. It's, it's important. Yeah, 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 of course. We can talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So, Hadia was the first one. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. Concerning the EVs, we know that it's an heterogeneous population. Yeah. So, how do you wonder if you isolate to, to differentiate the different types? What is your methodology? Uh, the methodology will take place in Obu. They are experts in this, and they will use the uh, system to carry out uh, extracellular vesicle. As I said, we have already been working with that in a previous project, so uh, it is uh, yeah. yeah. So you would differentiate the micro the microparticles differently from the exosomes, and then you. You will evaluate the functionality of uh, separately. Um, yeah. on, on the okay, so just a short question about education and training. Do you plan to have a course? Uh, not yet, but we can, uh, of course. Okay, so uh, just, just for practical information, you apply yeah. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. the year yeah. before the course. Okay, yeah. you don't have to apply this year for a course okay. that you may plan in three years. Yeah, yeah. We'll be, we will be thinking about it. Uh, uh, do you have a question? Uh, which beam quality is usually used for uh, irradiation? Uh, X-ray. Uh, which beam? Uh, ah, which beam? Uh, which uh, X-ray beam quality? So. It's the uh, uh, X-ray generator. It's called Girardoni. It works at 250 uh, kilovolts. Will you use digital space for in situ transcript homies in vivo? Uh, we have been contacting the company, but I cannot remember the details now, but I would like to know if you... Okay. No more questions. So thank you very much. Yeah. An interesting question. So the next uh, presentation will be by Jove about Sonora. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Roy Brukic and I'm a coordinator of the project Sonora. The full name of the project is towards safe, optimized and personalized radiology and radiotherapy procedures for pregnant patients. Uh, what is the context of this project proposal and why we decided to have exactly this topic? Uh, the reason is that a considerable number of uh, pregnant patients undergo the uh, are, basically, they are exposed to ionizing radiation each year. Uh, either they undergo the diagnostic or interventional radiology procedures or within the radiotherapy procedure. Main reason why the patients, pregnant patients, undergo the uh, diagnostic intervention of radiology uh, is trauma or pul pulmonary uh, embolia or similar uh, uh, stuff. And uh, radiation therapy, there is a reason. Uh, basically, the average age of the pregnant women is increasing in Europe in the past few decades. Uh, and when increasing the age, uh, the incidence of carcinoma increases also. Uh, although the, the pregnant patients with the carcinoma, uh, only one small percent of them is going to be treated with radiotherapy, but this, this number is also increasing. And this is why uh, we need to have better rules or guides uh, how to deal with these patients. Uh, 
the guidelines for uh, treating the pregnant patients already exist, but they are more than 20 years old. So we would want to improve lots of things changed in the past 20 years. So we want to improve the techniques. So uh, we need to uh, create a dedicated tools, phantoms, detectors, and uh, establish protocols for the fetal disinfection. Uh, how is our uh, con consortium uh, assembled? Basically, uh, we uh, we all, all the consortium members are part of the Eurodex uh, Association, uh, namely uh, work groups nine that deals with radiation dosimetry in radiotherapy, and work group twelve, 12 that uh, deals with uh, dosimetry in medical imaging. Uh, this spring, last spring, we sat together and we decided to have this topic, uh, since uh, both of these working groups uh, have uh, separate tasks dedicated to the uh, pregnant females. Uh, and we found the common denominator from both tasks and uh, decided to apply for this project. Uh, what are the aims and the expected benefits of this project? Uh, uh, first of all, we want to identify the factors uh, that affect the fetal dose, uh, the fetal dose estimations in methods used in clinical pra practice. Uh, we have done some work already, and we have seen that, uh, for example, in uh, diagnostic interventional radiology, there are plenty of tools that exist uh, for uh, estimating the fetal dose, but uh, their estimation differs up to eight times. That's almost a uh, order of ma magnitude, and we want to, let's say, uh, do the uh, independent verification of these tools. Uh, then we want to op optimize the radiological imaging techniques of pregnant females by creating the uh, computational phantoms of pregnant females and uh, physical phantoms of uh, pregnant females. We already have some experience in creating this, and we know that uh, uh, pre pregnant female phantoms, computational ones, uh, already exist on in the scientific community, but uh, what we want to do is create the personalized phantoms. Uh, basically, all majority of the phantoms that exist right now is created artificially by inserting the fetus into non-pregnant females and then modify it by the, the geometry. But this is not the realistic situation. We already published something where, where we analyzed uh, only two phantoms and the doses to the fetal deferred for 50 percent. That's uh, we need to include the uh, physiological characteristics of the mother, uh, uh, like body mass, heart, and so on, and also the fetal orientations. This, this is why we want to create a several computational phantoms, different, different ones. And also, uh, physical phantoms, uh, the problem is that the commercial physical phantom uh, of the pregnant female does not exist. Okay, we can use the Average female phantom for for the first trimester, but uh, the, the, that's that's it. We we need the, the phantoms for the higher st uh, stages of the pregnancy. Uh, then we want to investigate the fetal doses uh, and dosimetry methods for different uh, diagnostic interventional radiology procedures, <laughs> the patient and patient uh, anatomies, and especially we want to include the imaging doses into the treatment planning uh, system for. Uh, pregnant patients, because the majority of the treatment planning system uh, so far uh, that exists right now does not include the imaging doses into the final dose of the people. And then in, in the end, we want to provide a good practice guide for the radiology and for the radiotherapy. Benefits, as I already mentioned, uh, by creating a dedicated phantoms for different types of patients, uh, with different physiological characteristics, uh, we want to uh, develop a personalized medicine uh, and improve radiation protection of the pregnant patients. Uh, and then one very important part of our project is social outreach, and we want to have a quality risk benefit con communication with the patients, which is very important, especially in, in such uh, delicate situations when the pregnant patient undergoes the radiation procedures. Uh, and eventually, I hope that we will end by harmonization of the practices all over the year. Uh, how is our project organized? Uh, we have five work packages besides one with the project management. Uh, in the first, I, I must say that uh, we have agreed that uh, our work projects are people or institutions 
uh, who have large experience in conducting large uh, European projects. Uh, so the work package one is going to be uh, conducted by RSN. And uh, first of all, we want to analyze the state of the art, uh, do the literature review, how, do, how to handle the presentations, and uh, what are the current procedures when other presentations are undergoing this procedure. Uh, then the work, work package two, we will, uh, this, this one is coordinated by my institution, uh, we will create educated findings, uh, both computational and physical ones. Uh, and then this results from these two work packages will be input for you know, work packages three and four, which are kind of parallel, which is going to happen in parallel because uh, the, the one is going to deal with the radiology procedures and the other one with radiotherapy uh, procedures. In uh, work package three, uh, that is uh, coordinated by Greek Atomic Agency. Uh, we will do experimental campaigns and try to verify uh, the doses in uh, different situations and different procedures that undergo, that pregnant patients undergo. And in work package four, we will uh, conduct the radiotherapy experiments. First of all, we will uh, create, we will compare uh, different modalities of radiotherapy, uh, different types of radiotherapy, uh, then uh, we will also create a dedicated tool. The difference between radiology and radiotherapy is that in radiology, you have plenty of tools that test the dose to increase. And in radiotherapy, there is no one. And we will create one uh, to, for medical physicists, to, to, to enable medical physicists to easily calculate the dose uh, to the fetus, uh, just by choosing the type of primal phantom stage of pregnancy, the orientation and so on. Uh, and in the end, in the work of package four, we will also uh, try to include the fetal doses, uh, the doses from Im that come from imaging into the complete dose really received by treatment plan, uh, by radiation therapy. Uh, in the end, one very important part of our project is the social outreach. Uh, we uh, included the mem. Uh, partners from the social sciences uh, that will create workshops and uh, well, let's say it's how they call it uh, semi-structured interviews with uh, <laughs> uh, interested oil, oil, for example researchers uh, pregnant patients uh, uh, scientists and so on medical staff uh, what are materials methods for for the research, we dedicated 202 person months, meaning, uh, and the project is going to last 48 months, meaning that uh, each month more than four persons is going to work on the project simultaneously. How are we going to do this? We have experience since we are all gathered in the Eurodes platform. We have experience in computational methods, Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, we have also experience in developing the uh, physical phantoms. Uh, then uh, we will conduct experimental campaigns in several places in Europe, uh, both in radiology and radiotherapy. As I already said, we will develop the software for radiotherapy to include all the doses and to be able to, to assess the dose. And we will organize workshops with the, to the target audience and also create the metric materials for uh, pregnant patients uh, to reduce the anxiety they undergo when they need to. Uh, and undergo uh, medical procedures. Uh, our consortium is pretty large. We have uh, 17 institutions from 12 countries. Uh, we know that's a large number, but we already have a successful collaboration within the Eurodas platform. Uh, and we basically annually publish, I don't know, four or five publications per working group uh, each year. So uh, thank you all for the orientation and thank Piano Forte for the opportunity to finance that. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. In reflection, yes. On the picture, previous picture, you have a um, bubble detector. Yes. So you, this is for, for neutron dosage. Yes. Yeah. So you okay. yeah. have the That's the proton. Yes, yeah, that's the that proton. We have done recent some experiments, and I, I 
thought the picture is going to be appropriate for this. <laughs> stuff. Thank you very much. Um, I have questions. So, I mean, there, there are already you mentioned that phantoms might not be realistic because they are not done from pregnant women, but there are some that are from pregnant women. Yes. Right? So, will you take that into account first? And secondly, how is the personalization done? I, I did not quite get that. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, within our team, we have a radiologist and we have a database of pregnant patients with a DICOM, set of DICOM images of pregnant patients. And based on that, we will create a new set of items. Naturally, we will analyze the already the hunters that, we, that already exist. Not the market, but the scientific community. Uh, that stands for, for the first question. And the second one was... Uh, On the personalization. How will personalization. Be? Okay, when you create... We had the recent, uh, recent, there were two similar pregnant female phantoms, and the only difference was the fetal orientation. And the, the one, one patient is uh, standing up and one is lying with the head tilted, and the difference was 50% in the fetal dose. What are we intend to do? Personalize, we will create a, a lower height woman, a higher height woman. A fetal orientation, head up first uh, or head down, uh, body, with different body masses. And uh, when medical physicist comes, he will compare. Okay, I have a woman of 50 kilos, uh, height 170, in the third trimester, and so on. And then I can choose a copy. But will you change the, the, the parameters of imaging or therapy then? Uh, I hope, yes. Yes, but basically, uh, this phantom is going to be inserted into the <laughs> Uh, software package for Monte Carlo simulations, and then we will calculate the doses and adjust the parameters for the case. <coughs> of the <coughs> Congratulations on a really, I think, a really very important project. Um, I mean, to actually have this information about um, accurate people and placental doses is really important. What, what, what are the sort of Question or comment, really. Um, I mean, the first question is having established your dose through your through your modeling. Um, so the question is, are you then going to actually compare that dose to known outcomes and actually have a look and see whether there is a relationship between your predicted dose and the outcomes? Yes. But the comment, sorry, I'm wrapping this up together so you the point. Uh, the comment is actually that particularly with the fetal um, exposure, and I'll say fetal percent of unit exposure, there's always been the question mark of abscope effects and clustergenic factors because you've got the return of fetal um, perfusion. And so one of the interesting questions, I just wonder where you thought about trying to address this, is whether if there's a gap between the expected dose and the damage, might actually be able to say, well, here is it's for an upscope effect. Okay, I think we haven't considered that for the last, but we might consider that. You're right. And uh, for the first question, is uh, I already forgot. <laughs> so the question was really about whether you meant to actually compare your your yes 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 yeah to basically the outcomes. Sorry. Basically, the problem is that uh, we don't have the actual female that is undergoing these procedures. And when you're performing measurements, the, this phantom is made from molding and casting some artificial materials. You need to have the correction factors. So we will uh, do the Monte Carlo and then compare it to the experiment. Benchmark everything. Any other question? No? Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Just uh, a comment uh, about the uh, consortium which is uh, quite large, 17 uh, teams. And as I understand is involved, uh, I, I read the proposal and I noticed that uh, some groups requested a very small amount of money. So no problem for that. But I have a message for the next call. Try to avoid as much as possible to request very small amount of money. <laughs> because when you do that, it can be a very uh, heavy administration behind that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that it's forbidden, but 
for IRSN administration, it's really a nightmare to pay something like 600 euros. It will cost 1,000 euros to IRSN to, to pay that. Okay. <laughs> but no problem with silence. <laughs> okay, so let's move to the next presentation about Lutados. Again, personalized dosimetry and targeted therapy. Hi, um, good morning. So I'm Michel Kohler. Uh, I'm from the Catholic University of Leuven, and I will be the coordinator of this project. Um, it's called Lutados, and we will focus basically on personalized dosimetry to improve the clinical outcome of prostate cancer patients treated with lutetium or actinium PSMA targeted therapy. So these are actually therapies which are systemic. So it's a therapeutic radiopharmaceutical that is administered to the patient. It's either labeled with lutetium or with actinium, and it's specifically targeting a PSMA or prostate-specific membrane antigen. And so this is overexpressed by uh, tumor cells. And so that's what allows us to have a very specific high dose given to these uh, tumor cells. But so first, I, I would like to highlight again the general objective. So the objective is to increase, increase the clinical applicability of dosimetry for this type of therapies. And this is actually needed to finally go to indiv individualized treatment schemes. That's currently not the clinical uh, routine. Now in clinical routine, they used fixed activities. So it's independent of, of the tumor load or of the condition of the patients. So all patients get fixed activities, which basically results in a conservative, a conservative tendency to undertreat patients. And so basically with this project, we would like to have or to achieve a better balance between on the one hand, maximizing the tumor kill, and on the other hand, minimizing the toxicity to organ settlers. And just also to give you a bit of information about the clinical context. So prostate cancer is the second most frequent malignancy worldwide with over 1.4 million new cases each year. So that's based on data in 2020. So 10 to 20% of these patients develop castration resistant prostate cancer within five years. And the big majority of these patients involve into metastatic disease. And these are actually the patients who could benefit for this type of, of therapy. So the number of patients who could benefit from this type of therapy is very large. And it's a, it's, it's a challenge to further optimize these therapies. So how, we will, how will we achieve this? So this is to give you an overview of the work packages. So with the work packages, we will, co we will cover all the aspects of do dosimetry. So first, we will focus on the imaging. So we will make sure that we can acquire data sets at different time points after the radio pharmaceutical has been administered. Then we will tr translate these measured activities into dose maps. But to further improve this translation of activity to doses, we will also do some preclinical experiments where we will look at different factors which are crucial for this good translation of measured activities into doses. So now I, I will go over the different work pack packages. So the first pack work package is, is on imaging. So that's the current state of the art. So this is a SPECT system. So the, the imaging is done with a SPECT system. This is a SPECT system that is available in most clinical centers. The percentage price is, is reasonable. It's about 600,000K. So there is a large install base of this type of SPECT systems. The major disadvantage of, such, of using such a system is that a whole body scan uh, needs about one hour. So that's really not um, giving a lot of comfort to the patient. Also. It takes a lot of scanning time uh, from other procedures. So, but now we have this new next generation SPECT CT systems. They are based on solid state detector technology. With this system, you can acquire a whole body scan in 20 minutes. The downside is that the uh, investment cost is twice as, as large as for a, stand, a state of the art system. And therefore, we also have a limited install base. Now, within the, this Piano Forte project, we are now doing a clinical study where we are acquiring patients on both systems. So this is the DTCM SPECT scan that we acquire with the standard SPECT CT system. This is uh, 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 the same patient that has been scanned with this new generation of SPECT systems. You can appreciate the differences in image quality. And so now within this project, we, we will also try to improve the image quality of this type of system 
to actually mimic the image quality that we can generate with this type of system, and also to reduce the acquisition time, such that this imaging becomes much more accessible to patients. Um, we will also focus on actinium specs. So, what are the challenges with actinium specs? Uh, with actinium, we are administering a much lower amount of activity, so it's in the order of several megabecquerels. For lithium, we are administering a few gigabecquerels. Actinium is also generating a low amount of gamma emissions, which can be used for the imaging, and that basically results in data which are quite noisy, as, as you can see here. So, so here we will try to optimize the reconstruction, use as much data as possible. And actually, try to uh, obtain an image quality which is comparable to a lutetium spec. So, that's also one of the challenges of this project. Again, in work package one, we will gather a lot of expertise on these new systems, on, on the solid state systems. So, what we will do also in work package one, we have now an accreditation program running within the European Association of Nuclear Medicine, who is um, looking at quantitative lutetium spec, but for standard systems, we would try to extend this also to this next generation of solid state uh, spec uh, systems. We will also evaluate this new generation of spec systems for actinium spec. And then also, once that you have done the imaging, you also need to extract the time activity curves. So we also need a segmentation also within this work package. We will look at multi-organ um, segmentation, but also a segmentation of the tumor regions and mainly focus on the salivary glands because the salivary glands are the main organs at, at risk for this type of ter therapy um, because the radiotoxicity to, to the salivary glands is causing most of the side effects. So this is for work package one. Then for work package two, we will do some preclinical experiments where we look both at actinium and lutetium with PSMA. And first of all, you have to know that most of these patients first get a treatment based on lutetium and once they observe a radio um, re resistance or whether the, the therapy is not really effective, then they move to actinium-based therapies. So with this work package, we, we would try to see if the information that we have for the lutetium-based therapy, if we can also use that for the actinium-based therapy to have better estimates there. We will also revisit the relative biological effectiveness of both the therapies. We are now assuming that an actinium-based therapy is five to seven times more effective as an adhesion-based therapy, but we just want to confirm this, and we also want to make sure that we don't have to use a different factor for, for instance, the, the salivary glands or for the tumor to take into account the radiotoxic effect. And also, we will evaluate the recall daughter effect. <clears throat> so actinium is an alpha emitter. It emits an alpha particle. So we will have a recall that basically means that it will get detached from the vector, so it will not stay at the binding site. And that basically means that the radioactive daughters can redistribute. And within this work package, we also want to evaluate whether we should take into account the potential renal toxicity caused by the redistribution of free bismuth. And free bismuth is also an alpha emitter, so that can also be quite uh, to toxic. Then for work package three, we will again go to the clinical level uh, where we will mainly focus on actinium PSMA. First there, we will look whether small scale dosimetry would be needed because the range of alpha particles is much smaller than the range of beta particles. So for beta particles or for lutetium, you could assume a uniform distribution within the organ to perform your dosimetry. For alpha particles, you probably need to take into account the geometry and the heterogeneous distribution. And that has been shown for radium 2 to 3, that is also used to treat the bone metastasis. Radium 2 to 3 is mainly uh, located at the bone surface, and that basically means that the red marrow is only receiving a limited amount of radiation from the radium 2 to 3. And that can also be relevant for uh, prostate cancer patients who have a lot of metastasis in the skeleton. And then finally, we will also again try to translate the information that we have from the lutetium based therapies to the actinium based therapies. We will also not only calculate the doses, but we will also do an uncertainty analysis so that we can give some feedback to the medical doctor to which extent they can be certain about the doses that we are providing to them. That has already been performed for lutetium, and here you see that for the kidneys, you have a, an acceptable uncertainty of around 25% percent, but if the deletion become much more, also the uncertainty is increasing significantly. We will then, once that we have all these data, well, we, we will then re um, apply them retrospectively to patient data. 
and see whether the new estimates of absorbed dose are more in line with the response that we are observing with these patients. And then finally, we, we will also use um, the expertise that we are building up also to provide some guidelines for quantitative actinium spec to the community. So these are the partners within our consortium. We, have, we actually um, have two partners in Belgium, so the Catholic University of Leuven and the Belgium Nuclear Research Center. We have one partner in, in the Netherlands, the Erasmus Medical Center. In Germany, we have the Ludwig Maximilian University Hospital. And then in France, we have the Institut National de la Santé et de la Recherche Médicale in Brest. Uh, we are quite close to each other, so that it also um, facilitated the collaboration. Uh, there are also some students with ongoing EU projects. So there's the Alphamet project where we also involved in, which is basically an in initiative on the metrology for emerging targeted alpha ther therapies. We also involved in Rationale, which is a cost technique. And as mentioned before, we also involved in the accreditation program. But this is a short overview of the planning, but we will start with all work packages uh, in the first year. And it's a project that will cover the full four years. Uh, in terms of resources, we have allocated a bit more than three PhD students, which will, who will be mainly working on work package one and work package two. Work package three will be mainly driven by the senior researchers and also by the medical doctors. But we also are uh, aiming at the one to over three ratio in terms of supervision, just to make sure that the PhD students are supervised in, in a very good way. Um, so that is basically what I wanted to share with you. And thank you also for the opportunity uh, to perform this project. Michelle, any question? Yes. Uh, First thing, uh, thank you for the project. You are trying to go for therapy for the metastatic tumor or for the primary tumor? No, it's for the metastatic tumor okay. because that's basically a therapy that's generally used for patients with metastatic disease. Yes. So, when you're going to do the radiological studies, to be on the primary cells, Yes, they were sold the, the radiation before, but you said that the primary the, the, the beta mutation and after the actinium. Yeah. So if you want really to look for the RBE, you need to do exactly the same thing. Yeah. Are you yeah. doing that? Yes, but it but, but it will be the same thing, um, not like um, sequentially. So we will do it separately for the decision and separately for the actinium and see the differences in, in response. And based on that, we will yeah. try to make a revised our RBE. Yeah. That has to be determined. So, but basically, we will just indeed start from a cell line and then we will uh, apply both. Uh, so, we will apply, we will apply separately actinium and lithium. And see what the difference is in cell survival, and based on that, try to estimate an RBE. Yes, uh, that is very nice presentation. Uh, I uh, I was uh, thinking of uh, so the the basis what you what the whole therapy is based on that uh, prostate cancer cells have these very specific tumor specific uh, antigens PSMA. So the uh, radio nucleates uh, are uh, recognizing PSMA expressing cells. Nevertheless, it has been shown, uh, actually, we also showed in our prostate cancer studies that macrophages, phagocytes, and they also express PSMA at practically high level, and PSMA expressing macrophages level and is very specific concordant with the systemic PSA levels. So in this case, this uh, I wonder whether how you take into account that macrophages and other immune uh, 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 other components of the immune system recognizing the tumor cells will also be targeted by these uh, radionuclides, which might include uh, immune suppression in these patients, which are otherwise also metastatic. Yes. So indeed, you cannot exclude that also the ligands that we are um, administering to patients that they also will bind to other uh, cell cell types. But we are still assuming that uh, the amount of radiation that is given to these uh, cell types is lower than the, the radiation that is given to to the tumor cells, so that you still have this 
risk the benefit balance, which is still uh, on the good side, so to speak. Um, but, but indeed, because you also have expression in the um, of of P of PSMA also in the gastrointestinal system. So also there you will have some binding, but we are assuming that the radiation levels there are much lower than the radiation that will be given to the tumor. Also, it depends also a bit on, on, on the tumor load, because if you have a patient with a very high tumor load, that will be, basically function as a tumor sink. So most of the radiopharmaceutical will go to the tumor and less will be available for the healthy tissue or for other cell types. If you have a patient with a lower tumor load, then the, the sink effect will not be that important. And then it could be that you will also have more uptake in other cell types. So that's why also we think that you should perform some dosimetry just to make sure that the administered activities are in line with the tumor load that the patient has. Thank you very much. Do you have any idea why salivary glands are so sensitive to this therapy? Yes, so I think uh, lastly there, there, there was a paper um, actually describing the mechanism why PSMA was taken up by the salivary glands. I don't know exactly the mechanism, but so I think the, the mechanism now is known, but it's still very difficult to try to avoid this high uptake in the salivary glands. So still a lot of research is needed um, to avoid this uptake in, 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 in salivary glands. But, but also there, it's quite important to do some dosimetry because I don't think it's that important for lutetium-based therapies, but especially if you're working with actinium, like if first the patient has a very high tumor load, uh, the response can be quite fast. So that tumor load can reduce quite fast, actually. And then if you apply a second cycle or a third cycle, if there is a reduced tumor load, then probably the exposure of salivary glands will also be higher and the risk will be higher for radiotoxicity to the salivary glands. Thank you. So the mechanism is known, but it's still very difficult to, to try to block it and to reduce the, the, the uptake to the salivary glands. Thank you. Any other question? No. Thank you very much, Michel. Okay, next uh, talk is uh, about uh, Verify, and it's for us that we give the presentation. Yeah, that's, that's my. Oh, that's my. That's it. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Hrvoj uh, Hršak. I'm a medical physicist from uh, KBC Zagreb and one, one of the partners at the verified, in the Verified project. I will present the project uh, today uh, in place of our coordinator, Luana De Freitas Nascimento, as she was not able to be here today with us in person, but I believe she's present online. I don't know if she will be able maybe to add some answers or cl clarifications later if uh, needed. Um, radiotherapy. Target volume is dynam dynamic. It, uh, during the radiotherapy treatment course, it changes in the size, position, biology, and uh, single. We can see that single uh, treatment plan generated at the beginning of the or before the beginning of the treatment cannot warrant uh, the desired dose coverage of the tumor and the desired sparing of the. Uh, nearby uh, critical organs or tissue. So it is uh, our goal in this project to, to try to develop uh, to develop uh, in vivo patient-specific real-time dosimetry system for the adaptive radiotherapy as adaptive radiotherapy now is the state of the art in the modern, in the modern, modern uh, radiotherapy. And uh, uh, for that purpose, we will uh, we gathered a group of uh, clinicians and researchers coming for, from the Four institutions from the five institutions, two universities, two university hospitals, one research center. The project is divided uh, into six, six uh, uh, work groups, and uh, the plan uh, uh, duration of the project uh, would be uh, four years. And so uh, the first task uh, in the first work package, the first scientific task will be uh, design, development, and characterization of the tissue equivalent anatomically realistic phantoms that can mimic the brain tumors, bladder tumors, and the lung tumors, which are the targets of this project as the most uh, sensitive uh, localizations uh, sensitive to the changes during the treatment course. 
and uh, for that we will uh, try to uh, design the different uh, uh, types of the phantoms and specifically we will focus on uh, we will focus uh, on developing the, the phantom which can really also the movement by utilizing uh, the deformable materials you can see in this video i don't know if the video is functioning here you can see one example of the phantom that is designed at the maastricht university uh, this is tissue equivalent phantom with the deformable uh, lung, and you can see the movement of the target. It consists of the phantom and some mechanical and electrical parts. So this is, a, let's say, the good role model uh, for designing the uh, uh, how to design the phantom. Um, uh, the next work package will uh, deal with uh, will investigate the real time uh, patient specific dosimetry system. And we will focus on the integration of this camera based system, which was uh, developed at ACK with the phantoms that will be uh, developed in the work package one. Uh, by using this uh, uh, system, we will, uh, with a high temporal and space resolution, it is uh, in, in the millis time resolution, we expect to be in the milliseconds, and the space resolution will be in the micrometers, which is maybe too much. But we expect very, very high resolution and a lot of uh, a lot of data uh, to collect. Here you can see uh, one example. Just start another video. Uh, you can see one example where the treatment on the treatment. I think for the, the this was for the brain tumor was uh, executed on the phantom. Uh, this is a VMAX treatment, but it was executed. Uh, with the linear from the gantry position at the zero degrees, and uh, you can see how the scintillation coating was used to detect and to to uh, record uh, the dose distribution with a large amount of data that will then be used to fit to fit the uh, deep learning algorithm in able to create the prediction model. Here, the simple prediction was made using the I think the name of the algorithm was UNET. Don't uh, ask me about the details because I don't know much about this uh, algorithm. And here you can see how how the dose distribution was uh, correctly, let's say, uh, predicted uh, by the system. Okay. Um, the next work group will uh, uh, work package will uh, will be done uh, parallel with the school, and it, and it will deal it will deal with the uh, Using development of an image based monitoring system for the type of reaction that they provide the surgery. Uh, this moment, let's say the state of the art in the gamma knife radio surgery when we have the fractionation is the monitoring of just a single point at the patient nose. And here, at this graphical representation, in the real time, you can just monitor the one single point. You can uh, select the threshold, which you want uh, not to be. Uh, 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 to be crossed, and then you can just monitor one single point, but you don't have information what is happening with the dose, dose coverage and the irradiation of, of the normal tissue. So what we would like to develop instead of monitoring one point is monitoring the whole surface of the patient head, and for that purpose we will uh, use the so-called uh, full projection method, where we have uh, a projector from the one angle uh, emitting the light on the surface of the on the surface of the patient head at a certain angle that will be detector uh, detector will be detector will detect the fringes these fringes have the uh, sinusoidal pattern and because of the difference in the in the shape of the object there will be the phase shift between the uh, fringes and this phase shift will actually give us information about the height of the object and that way we will be able to construct the 3D irregular shape of the patient head. We expect that uh, time resolution will be a uh, fraction of the second and, and the space resolution will be submillimetric, which, which is according to the requirements for the gamma knife uh, uh, radio surgery. Very important is that we have uh, that we have to take into account that each fraction would be up to the 50 minutes. So there is a big probability there will be movement during the treatment. So I think this approach is justified. Uh, the work package four 
will be uh, continuing uh, continuous uh, uh, work uh, after the work package two, and we will try to design the real time dose prediction system for the adaptive radiotherapy by using a, a deep learning model in a way that we will combine uh, the measurement data obtained using the camera ACK camera based system and the phantoms designed in the work package uh, one. Uh, and we will also fit this system, this deep algorithm, uh, the deep learning algorithm model with the patient specific information, images, treatment planning, uh, treatment delivery data, a lot of uh, other parameters which, uh, which are connected uh, to the patient. In that way, we will use this data first with the part of the data to designed to uh, train the model and then later for uh, we will uh, use this data for the evaluation of the model and after that we will retrospectively analyze the existing number of the for the lung and the bladder uh, more than 2000 patients which are treated with uh, volumetric uh, uh, modulated arc therapy to see how the adaptive radiotherapy uh, how the dose uh, would should be or, will, or could be predicted for them. From this uh, large uh, uh, base of the data, we will then maybe able to predict future scenarios or desirable scenarios for the for the quality uh, of the adaptive radiotherapy. Work package uh, five uh, will uh, use the information or, or 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 the knowledge acquired during the work package three and the work package four for uh, designing another model now for the patient selection for the hyperfractionated gamma f radio surgery using as well deep learning uh, algorithms. Uh, here on this example, you can see how the adaptive hyperfractionated gamma f radio surgery is working. This is uh, one of our first patients treated with adaptive in uh, adaptive procedure in the uh, in the gamma life center in Zagreb. You can see how the dose distribution, this is the yellow, uh, the yellow line, is adapted from the fraction to fraction to obtain the tumor control and to reduce the neurotoxicity. But the real question here is how to select the patient for the hyperfractionated radio surgery. So far, it was done by the neurosurgeon and the medical physicist by manual pre-planning. But you, might, you could have the skillful uh, planner or, or a less skillful planner. And then you might end up in this process by uh, coming to the different decisions. We want to avoid this, or let's say to, to complement the, the process of the making decision by adding the robust and uh, reliable uh, deep algorithm based model uh, to predict, to, uh, uh, to predict uh, or to try to, uh, let's say, uh, help the neurosurgeon to select a properly patient for the adaptive hypofractinated radio surgery. For that purpose, we will use the data obtained uh, from the measurements, and also we will uh, use the data from the available 2,000 and 500 patients, of which are 60 already treated with the hypofractinated radio surgery, uh, with the mask, and 20 are treated with the stereotactic frame fixation. And on the rest, 2,400 patients, we will also do the retrospective analysis and then we will see how many of these previously treated patients actually were to be treated with adaptive uh, radio surgery. Uh, so all in all, uh, we think that uh, the project is uh, well connected, uh, well distributed over the four, year, four years. The uh, work groups are uh, well interconnected, leading from one to another. And the last work package will be uh, management and dissemination to deal with the training, uh, uh, workshops, and the publications. We accept at least that there will be one uh, high quality uh, uh, publication uh, per one work package. We expect that this project will add additional uh, knowledge to the adaptive radiotherapy, and maybe that our method will be then eligible for uh, further clinical and scientific testing uh, in adaptive radiotherapy. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. Any question? It's tough. Yeah, thank you very much. My, I actually have two questions. First one is, um, I didn't really get why this, this 
sub second uh, or sub resolution um, of this very fast resolution screen. So I think it would let's be. let's go back to the for example here you have uh, even work package two was uh, yeah okay like you said. It's very fast. I mean, it doesn't have to be at the range of the milliseconds. It's currently what the system allows. Of course, we will prob probably optimize and lower lower this. But you can you want to capture the interfractional movements, and now you know that in the VMAT you have uh, very quick machines, for example, as Varian Atos or Varian Halcyon or or maybe some others that can deliver one single fraction in less than a minute. So within one single fraction, you can have some, let's say, uh, very, very, very small movements at the scale of the seconds. Yeah, but my question was, what do you gain? But I, I think it's okay. Uh, the the other um, question is, do you have ethical approval for using that data that you? Uh, at my hospital at this moment, no. But the, all the data will be fully anonymized. So it doesn't help. Yeah. You want to publish? No way. We, we have just gone through it, that, uh, okay. not, not our hospital, but within another project, so that's very... Uh, in preliminary preparations, uh, we got the warranties from our hospitals that we will be able to use this data. So later on, there will be a lot of paperwork, of course, to, to, to uh, get uh, uh, ethical appro approval. But I mean, based on the based of the experience of other projects from my hospital, it will be possible to do. And use them, but if you want to publish, people will ask for an ethical approval sign. We will provide it, I believe. So, I think it's a totally stupid question, but you, you see all your talk on the tumor, on how the target in the tumor, the dose of the tumor. How do you expect to get uh, the dose of the normal tissue? Are you also evaluating the, the normal tissue and the dose of the normal tissue? Yes, if you, are, if you look at this. Let me just start the again this video. And let's go here, for example. Okay, now we'll stop. So this is actually this is actually oh sorry. Good. So this is the actually you see the uh, distribution of the tube, but here also you have the information about the dose. And also, you will have the low, low, low dose information. It's not visible here, but you will have also information from the low dose uh, surrounding, and also you will have from the uh, 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 dose metrics from the TPS. Also, you will have uh, the information of the low dose on the normal tissue. Will that cover your response timing? Yes, of course, of course, because treatment planning system will be dosimetrically verified. So you have to verify not just the tumor dose, dose for the tumor, but also the surrounding dose as well. So with the question of the accuracy. <clears throat> yes. And moreover, on the same page, uh, coming back to the <laughs> sorry, I didn't hear. Can you repeat it? Uh, coming on the same page, coming back to the next slide where there is the icon uh, gamma knife. Yes. Exactly. So I understand that maybe you are doing the you are following the, the face movement. Okay. Yeah. But I don't understand how you can correct it. The icon uh, can adapt the movement with the icon because the icon is, is, is fixed in the position, so that you can change nothing. In accelerator, I understand. In icon, everything is, is fixed during the yes, fraction. But... You can change only after the fraction, but during the fraction, you can do nothing because the head is, is fixed in a, in a position. There is no way to do anything. No, actually, you can do. You can stop the fraction. You can do the, again the CBCT scanning and reposition the patient, and then you can do the re-evaluation, adapt the plan, and then continue with the evaluation. Using the treatment. Yes. So during... is it from 50 will become uh, 500. Ah, 500. No, 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 because I mean. I'm jogging for 500. Yeah, yeah. But of course, it is not justified during the one fraction to to, for, for example, to give the. 10 CBCT scanning of the patient. That's not acceptable, of course, from the from the point of the of the dose to the patient. But uh, it is allowed to do a couple of scanning during a CBCT scanning during the one fraction because they are very very low protocol protocol with very very low doses. And this CBCT will be used to correct the position of the patient. And then uh, 
continue do the replanning and then continue uh, with the treatment. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. So we move to the next presentation. Uh, it's image mix. I don't know. Who, you you will do the presentation. No, no, no. There's <laughs> Catalina. Catalina. We'll do it. Good morning. I'm here on behalf of Giza Shapjain, who uh, was supposed to present his uh, talk, but uh, due to some unexpected commitments, he could not be here. So I will try to uh, replace him. So um, uh, uh, the project I will spoke about, I will speak about, with the acronym of Imijomics. Uh, was answering the second topic of the pianoforte call, individualized diagnostic and therapeutic procedures with regard to optimization of the benefit-risk ratio. And the title of the top of the project, as you can see here, is optimizing benefit-risk ratio in breast cancer diagnosis and radiotherapy, identifying molecular, cellular, and imaging signatures of breast cancer heterogeneity to improve personalized therapeutic strategies for synergistic treatment combinations. When we started to prepare this proposal uh, and we decided to answer the topic two, we were assuming that most proposals will be targeting the delivery, the dosimetry and the instrumental aspect of how to answer this or how to improve this benefit risk ratio. Nevertheless, we are not dosimetrists and um, we tried to answer another aspect of this uh, uh, poll, namely how we can improve uh, uh, the problem from the patient side. But first, let me introduce you the team. So uh, basically, we are four, how to call it, working teams within this project. Uh, the National Center for Public Health and Pharmacy uh, with the coordination of Geza Schaffrein, uh, uh, Otto von Gericker University, Germany, it's Magdeburg University with uh, uh, Christoph Hirschen, uh, University of Pavia, where two groups will be included, Giorgio and uh, his colleague Claudia Scotti. And as a non-pianoforte member, a fourth member is uh, uh, IS Global uh, from Barcelona. But uh, you know that uh, uh, since uh, uh, both uh, University of Magdeburg, of Pavia are uh, affiliated entities and IS Global is a non-pianoforte member, technically we had to include also their POMs but they are only administrative partners, either with zero budget or with very low amount of the budget. Uh, so now let me tell you about the problem we wanted to address and the solution proposed by Imijomics. So uh, we all know that increasing ionizing radiation doses by the general population uh, due to medical diagnostic and therapeutic interventions is a huge problem within the field of radiation protection, but also within the field of medical community. And this also highlights that joint efforts are needed by both communities in order to improve uh, the diagnostic and treatment efficacy. So, as I told you, one way to answer this problem is to improve the symmetry or to make technical improvements in, 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 in uh, uh, the uh, uh, diagnostic or therapeutic uh, instrumentation. Nevertheless, another approach is uh, to try to uh, 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 improve therapy decision making by uh, introducing novel diagnostic uh, means uh, that can uh, uh, answer at the patient level better 
what is the best therapy for that particular patient. And another aspect is, especially now, when we know that uh, radiotherapy, first of all, that emerging new therapeutic fields in oncology, such as immunotherapy, can be efficiently combined with radiotherapy or vice versa. We can say that radiotherapy can be efficiently combined with immunotherapy. However, these combinations uh, or the success rate of these combinations currently is pretty low. This is most probably due to the factor, due to the factors that we need to improve those uh, sort of immunogenic markers at the tumor level that respond to radiotherapy and that help synergizing the two therapeutic means. So another, um, uh, um, how to say, uh, uh, proposed solution of immunogenics was to try to find markers that uh, uh, point to a maximum synergy or an, an increase uh, the synergy between radiotherapy and immunotherapy. And these two approaches together would lead to uh, uh, an improved uh, therapeutic efficiency and consequently to decrease doses to the patient. So the objectives of the proposal are the following. Uh, to investigate how radiotherapy influences immunogenic heterogeneity of breast cancer cells of different molecular subtypes using in vitro and in vivo approaches. To test the applicability of nanoparticles for X-ray fluorescence computed tomography to be used for the detection of breast cancer heterogeneity to identify local and systemic signatures that predict patient benefit from combined radiotherapy and immunotherapy and test their clinical applicability. And finally, to integrate the data retrieved from experimental models and human studies with epidemiological data to build up a protocol for optimal patient stratification. So what is our model? Uh, we have a, a, a combined uh, a complex. Very simple one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I will try to, I mean, I know it's not simple. I will try to guide and explain and hopefully, well, it will become a bit clearer in a minute or two. I hope. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it's a more simplified. Uh, we had a bit more complex one in the proposal, but now it's a simplified one. Sorry, I, I, I promised to, to try to tell you. Um, okay, so we have a complex in vitro approach using uh, various cell lines. I will tell you about that in a minute. An in vivo approach using uh, murine models of breast cancer. And uh, mainly through the uh, uh, um, University of Pavia, uh, uh, the human breast cancer uh, samples will be also taken into the study. So uh, we had a very conservative approach for the uh, start of the in vitro uh, work, uh, namely that uh, using commercially available uh, breast cancer cell lines, of various histology types, of various uh, 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 genetic uh, and molecular subtypes. Luckily for this particular uh, cancer type, a high number of such cell lines are available, around 40 primary cancer cell lines of mainly uh, triple negative breast cancers, but not exclusively are available. I cannot promise to use all 40 in our studies, but uh, at least we have a, a choice uh, 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 to select from these. A first approach will be to look at these cell lines and to test their radio sensitivity index, which was published in several publications, and to link uh, this radio sensitivity index of the different cell lines of different histology and molecular subtypes with the uh, uh, immunogene expression signatures. These are uh, uh, certain predefined 
gene sets uh, um, uh, expressing uh, cytokine and chemokine uh, genes that were uh, reported to be linked with the radiation response of that particular tumor cells. Also taking uh, the help of artificial intelligence uh, uh, and uh, the help of uh, uh, Giorgio. And this will be a first pre-selection of the cell lines. And in those cell lines in which we can see that radiotherapy, uh, uh, radiation, and consequently also radiotherapy, but radiation modulates the immunogenic uh, uh, signature of these cell lines, will be put in co-culture studies, either 2D cultures or 3D cultures, and will be uh, uh, functional immune assays will be um, uh, performed on, on various scales. I will not detail now. And those cell lines, which indeed at functional level proved to modulate the immune response, for these cell lines, we will perform an immunopeptidomic analysis. This immuno, uh, after irradiation, immunopeptidomic analysis is a type of investigation which specifically uh, identifies those peptides which linked to the NHC molecules uh, are immunogenic, so are able to actively induce an immune response. It's a high throughput screening. However, by this, we are able to identify novel tumor antigens which respond or are modulated by radiotherapy. So this will be a second uh, sort of uh, uh, input uh, uh, for the third part of the project. And then we will have the in vivo model, the animal model, in which uh, we will investigate the microenvironment of the tumor and how this is modulated um, by radiotherapy. Uh, by identifying either the immunopeptids or and or the immune gene signatures in vitro, uh, this will be a feedback to the human um, uh, investigations. Since uh, at Pavia, approximately, I guess, 300 or I don't know exactly the number, but quite high number of patients uh, treated with different radiotherapy protocols of very well-defined uh, histological and molecular basis of breast cancer will be investigated at multiple levels. Among others, there will be a single cell transcriptomics and the special spatial transcriptomics and proteomics performed for these tumors using the cosmic uh, um, uh, infrastructure from nanostring, which allows uh, identification of tumor heterogeneity at uh, geometric and spatial level. Um, and obviously, uh, at, humans, uh, uh, at the human level, we will check uh, the, the, the markers identified in vitro or in vivo, and this will give a feedback um, uh, to uh, what uh, we're doing. And then, all these data will be integrated in um, in uh, how to improve the imaging side of, of, uh, of, um, of the problem. Since uh, uh, this X-ray uh, uh, fluorescence computer tomography imaging takes use of various nanoparticles, which can be coupled with specific um, uh, uh, markers with the tumor and actually they entered the cell and they target these specific markers. So ideally they are able to identify in vivo the heterogeneity of the tumor. Now I would like to stress that within this particular proposal we did not propose to technically develop these uh, nanoparticles. We proposed to make a proof of principle that they indeed work and coupling of these nanoparticles to individual markers will be uh, the task of other projects, um, other, other not in, within this project. Uh, all together, uh, gathering the information from, from the various aspects of the project, 
we will compare it with what is available at uh, a literature space and also uh, openly available databases. And the task would be to develop a protocol on defining as well as possible those patient categories who are uh, most probably uh, optimal for the combination of radiotherapy with immunotherapy, backed up by markers with I'm ready with uh, 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 of immunogenic, immunogenic type. And this will lead to reduction in the doses of the patients as well. So the structure, we have five uh, uh, work packages. One is investigating the in vitro signatures of cell lines. The second one is also in vitro, but also the development of the, ex of the uh, nanoparticles. The third one is the in vivo part. Um, the fourth one is uh, data integration and development of protocol uh, as a proof of concept. And uh, uh, work package five is uh, coordination and dissemination. Finally, the budget, you can see that the budget uh, uh, is 1.5 million, uh, requested EU funding 885,000 is a very well balanced budget. Uh, and the, the partners uh, are, uh, the tasks of the partners are also well balanced and integration uh, among the tasks and among the partners are also hopefully optimal. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Katarine, for this nice presentation. Again, possible. Yeah. Which even response should look like? Because you get different type of response by radiation. So, are you looking to the email? Which one are you looking Well, both, because the first aspect is uh, uh, antigen up uptake by dendritic cells and whether uh, then they can activate T cells. So uh, dendritic cells are innate immune response, but then uh, T cell activation is an adaptive one. Uh, second question, I'm sorry. The second is which dose are needed? Sorry, which? Short of prediction. Short of prediction, you are not going to respond. Well, basically, we will use uh, radiation doses that are comparable for individual fraction doses in radiotherapy. So why is it correct? We know that the immune response in drugs is totally different than in human. That's very well defined. Yeah. Um, I, um, so how are you going to, to link actually the mice to human uh, process? I completely agree with you. This is why we decide this very complex in vitro approach, because which will be done in human uh, system. However, uh, we not avoid mice, unfortunately, because we do not have uh, a system where we can investigate at experimental level the, the inflammatory uh, aspect of the tumor, um, uh, certain cell infiltrations uh, of the tumor and compare the different uh, uh, histological and, and, uh, and genetic types so this is why we will use mice and take use of that. But obviously we will have feedback from the in vitro system and from the humans. Uh, a couple of uh, sort of comments and a question again. Really. Again, congratulations on a, a really interesting project. It's very interesting to see the in vivo and ex vivo you know, against the um, against the uh, clinical parts of the study, clinically applicable parts of the study. Um, so a little bit in response to Francois' questions, um, have you considered using humanized mice? Because you, you can use humanized mice yes. with a very, very effective <laughs> yes. human type anti tumor. We definitely have considered that. And we, we dropped the idea for two reasons. One is extremely practical. Humanized mice are very expensive. With this budget, we can afford to use maybe five, six humanized mice or not much more, which is does not make sense. Our other argument beyond the financial aspect was that 
we consider at this stage using humanized mice might be a bit too early. So you can go using humanized mice once you already have something in hand. And so the, the other part of the question is really about the heterogeneity. Sorry? The heterogeneity in your starting cell populations. So, um, I mean, having, having worked with a lot of these cell types, you never start with a pure population. So you always start with a mixed population in terms of gene expression, behavior, whatever. And so a lot of what you see when you're radiating something like tube gray is actually um, selection for some parts of that population. And I just wondered if you you'd thought of actually um, trying to characterize some of that heterogeneity just simply by examining your populations to see what you have there before you start. Yeah, okay, there were some details. I didn't go into them. And obviously, we will do immune phenotyping of the cells, so what they are express, what uh, not only immune phenotyping, but phenotyping in general. So we will try to characterize. However, we have to assume that an in vitro culture is to a certain level, if not homogeneous, but at least in time reproducible, because that's why in vitro cell lines are used. Uh, but we do, yes, some sort of, I didn't go into that detail. Yes. Sorry, can you repeat the beginning of your question? I liked your immunopectomics and the ability to identify tumor antigens. So you can identify tumor antigens of interest that are radiation relevant for yes. an immune response. The proof of the principle is what happens in patients. So your ability to look at those and you imply that would be at the RNA level. You only have one small cohort that you mentioned is 300 patients. So we would need multiple cohorts to look at to see how those antigens affect tumor outcomes. So have you given consideration to use of other tumors, for example, TCGA, and others will be under there. And the other thing is you want a cohort where patients have had radiation and immunotherapy, what cohorts might be available? First, let me answer to your first question. Uh, we will not do immunopeptidomics at the patient level. No, no, I know that. You will identify mm -hmm. antigens that may be clinically relevant. To show that, look at patient cohorts. You mentioned one cohort of 300 patients. This is a, a breast cancer patient. I am not very much familiar of the details of the cohorts, but basically the principle was to focus mainly on triple negative breast cancer patients, but not exclusively. So this will constitute the, the major part of the cohort. Uh, from the immunopeptidome analysis, we will identify hopefully certain antigens responsive to radiotherapy, and it will be made sort of a proof of principle in these cohorts, whether having the same histology or having the same uh, molecular type compared to as much compared to the uh, work, whether they can be identified as patient level as well. But my point <laughs> multiple cohorts, it needs to be more, as many cohorts as possible. You have to start somewhere. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. So we move to the last uh, uh, presentation by Christophe in print. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for everybody staying still here. Um, so, and thanks for the opportunity to present our project here. I would start with uh, guiding you through the partners of the project first. So uh, we are supposed to coordinate that. Then uh, you learn from Katalin that we are looking into, or that they are looking into breast cancer. We are also doing that. And we are trying to provide more of the technology needed so we have the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf that is uh, specialized in these nanoparticles, and you will see that 
a bit and uh, NNK is also uh, involved again and then uh, we need to optimize the technology because one of the things that we do want to do is we do want when when we try to transport it into humans we need to have something where we can you see like image the uh, heterogeneity that uh, Katalin was talking about um, and so we need some people to help us with that because we are uh, like um, providing the general possibility of doing this imaging and I will show you that in a minute uh, but we need dedicated detectors to optimize that to the tasks that we have and therefore we have people from Joseph Stefan Institute in Ljubljana from CSIC um, in uh, Spain and uh, you know why Euromed is there because OBG is uh, an affiliated entity and the title of all this is an integrated molecular imaging for personalized biomarker based breast cancer characterization and treatment um, and it's also targeting the topic two, as you see it here. Um, I didn't write the, the numbers uh, here, so we will run for 36 months um, as the detector development is expensive. Uh, we did prepare to, to do it longer. <laughs> and uh, on the other hand, uh, we will spend, uh, or the, the total uh, cost of the project is 1.499 million. <laughs> So we really targeted them. <laughs> Actually, it was 910. So <laughs> um, I, I think we, we targeted that. So what are the goals and the focus? So we want to develop advanced in vivo imaging tools and methodologies for better characterization of breast cancer disease and radiation sensitivity on plantation basis. And the idea here is if, if you look for optical methods, then you're always limited to like something on the surface, basically, or maybe within a millimeter or a few millimeters inside into a tissue. Um, you will never be able to get something out of the patient again. And with X-ray fluorescence, you would be able to do that. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about X-ray fluorescence and, and uh, other things that we need before we use X-ray fluorescence. Uh, to make that feasible and the idea behind it. Um, but the point is, we, with that, we can investigate in the long term, not, not within this project, but in the long term, really imaging in humans. And before that, we can use human organoids. That's something that we will also uh, use in image genomics um, process. The tools that we will develop are also intended to evaluate biomarkers for individual radiation responses. So it, to have in the future a fast optimization of radiation therapy protocols and IR based applications in clinical practice and protection of healthy tissues at risk. That's a final goal. And um, I think we, we try to find ways to improve that task really. But you see, if you personalize radiation based medicine might be imaging or therapy, then you need always also uh, you know, social sciences and humanities to talk about how you decide then based on the information you get. So we have the goal to have enhanced protection of healthy tissues in breast cancer patients, specifically of the critical and at risk patients by minimizing potential IR induced health effects and treatment related toxicities. So um, we say that imaging has to be combined in a certain way and therefore we will combine dark field and X-ray fluorescent CT, uh, which would be an integrated and over the hybrid tool for personalized in vivo tumor profiling. So um, we, we are looking for the microstructural information beyond conventional radiographic resolution. So if you take a normal radiograph in the CT, you are something like in the millimeter range of uh, maybe slightly below for a CT image. Uh, but sometimes the structural information that you need is lower than that. Um, we need to have an enhanced contrast information, uh, which is sensitive to the structural variations in a, a nanometer to micrometer scale. Um, and then to optimize towards low dose uh, breast cancer imaging. So therefore we would like to use uh, no longer energies below 30 keV, but in the range of 30 to 50 keV. And then the X-ray fluorescence part is that uh, we would like to um, surpass PET or SPECT in spatial resolution and MRI in sensitivity and specificity 
for human sized cases. So the spa high spatial resolution, we have to optimize the dose if we want to do that with XF. Uh, I, so with um, X-ray fluorescent CT, then we need to really know in which area we are looking for the nanoparticles. That's the task. Um, and for that, we will use this dark field imaging of the large scale so that we know already where to look at, where is the relevant information, where is the heterogeneity that we want to see. And then we will do XF CT in that area. So with that, we will have a dose-optimized characterization of tissues and heterogeneities, which can be targeted then by radiation therapy. And um, we will, with that, hope to have a biologically optimized and dedicated in vivo molecular imaging approach. And we will have to couple that with in vitro diagnostics, identifying the breast cancer biomarkers, and we will only um, make some use of very specifics that we can couple our nanoparticles to. So it is a synergistic approach combining the hybrid imaging and biopsy methods. So we will also use uh, biopsies here for finding these markers. So that would lead us to a very simple uh, model again. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I will try to guide you through. So I'll start with the, with the last work package. Work package five is the project management um, coordination and impact creation. Um, and then we have um, four work packages that really try to do the, the work uh, for, for that. Uh, you see here, um, these are work package three is the signatures and intratumor um, independence uh, heterogeneities in breast cancer. And so we will look for uh, signatures in intra and uh, intertumor heterogeneity in breast cancer, which would be suitable for detection to nanoparticles. Um, we will relapse a uh, uh, release of markers into circulation and potential um, targets for liquid biopsy investigation. And we will do molecular characterization of breast cancer through in vivo tumor models. And I mentioned some of them already. In the work package two, this is very closely interlinked. We now have to interlink these markers that we have identified for the different topics to um, the nanoparticles. So first of all, we need to design suitable targets for the nanoparticle design. And then we need to have suitable breast cancer models for the XFCT functional investigations. And we have to do potential uh, breast cancer models for um, dark field imaging. And then we have to uh, look for the interactions between um, um, EVs and nanoparticles to then be able to couple them, which is the main work of the uh, work package two, the NP conjugates, uh, synthesis, characterization, and optimization. And the last part in that is the molecular, cellular, and immune signatures of uh, breast cancer cells and role of immune infiltrating immune cells. And so you see these two work packages, they are really working very closely together. Now, when we have these two work packages, we hopefully have markers coupled to nanoparticles that we can then put into whatever kind of human or uh, in vitro tissue or mice tissue and so on, and then really do the imaging. And to do the imaging, and I will try to explain that here, um, that's actually the work package one, the integration for image-based profiling in breast cancer, uh, the hybrid um, dark field imaging and XFCT. Um, so we will build a system that uh, basically has uh, um, a system with a, uh, with a source that can be moved around our tissue. And then we will have a grating based situation here. And for those that are familiar with um, dark field imaging, what we do not use is another uh, grid here to optimize the dose. We uh, try to do that with a microfocus source. And then uh, we do get like dark field images here, which is a lot of um, mathematics that you have to do to get to the, to the imaging. Uh, and then you can identify the areas where you have some structural in, uh, heterogeneity. And in these areas, we will then do an XFCT uh, only for the small area. 
So we irradiate this part where we then have uh, added the gold nanoparticles coupled to uh, biomark uh, to the biomarkers, and then we will see on detectors around the um, substrate, the mines, whatever, we will see then an enlightening, as you know it from the club where you have going and you had a white uh, uh, shirt on there, you will see the fluorescence and now we see the X-ray fluorescence and it's in a range, again, it's emitting X-rays in the range of um, like 60 or 80 kV again. And then we can detect that and the point is to get a signal that we can really evaluate, we need to have detectors that allow, on the one hand side, a very good spectral discrimination of the incoming signal, because what we will generate here is not only fluorescence, but a lot of scatter. And the scatter would reduce our resolution dramatically if at all we could see something. So we need to have a spectral resolution to be able to detect that. And the system has to be fast because we have to know from where the signal is coming. And um, so that's why we need this, this large task, this work package four on um, detector uh, generation. So this is the proof of principle that we will do for an X-ray based detector system, which is much more able to work on an XFCT than what we have today. Uh, so today we would only be able to um, do very low resolution uh, XFCT, I mean, it's still much better than PET or something like that, but it's not the way that we wanted to have. So let us talk a minute, or let me talk a minute about the detector development. Oops, wrong. Uh, what do I have to do as a Mac person? <laughs> Just to make it larger. Yeah. Okay, there we are. Thanks a lot, Anna. Um So I, I'm trying to push the right button now. Okay. So what we have is a, we have a small pixel PNCCD. You can buy that, um, and they are built on small sensors from existing waivers. Um, and um, you see that that's the size with the uh, pixel size of 36 microns, and the resolu energy resolution is at the intrinsic level, so it's at around 1k uh, kV or something like that, or even a little less. And the repetition rate is higher than one kilohertz, and we will make them stackable, um, and so we can process them for one or even two millimeters in principle. And here you see such systems that are built on such wafers. Uh, this is the layout uh, reproduce, uh, sorry, or this is a, how it is uh, produced. This is an image of that. And then this is uh, just to see whether all the structures are there, uh, like a threshold image on that. And then we also already uh, identified the, the structures to be sure that we can really build that of a whole stacked detector. So we know the system's components are there. We have to stack them together uh, in a useful uh, way. So the principle is we have a backside illuminated uh, CCD uh, with a frame store, a split frame, and a column parallel readout. Now I can use this one, but we do not only need to develop the detectors, but we also need to develop um, the markers uh, connected with the gold nanoparticles. And here you see subs, uh, citrate stabilized gold nanoparticles developed in uh, Düsseldorf, and we um, these have a size of around 20 nanometers and if you go to polyvinyl alcohol stabilized gold nanoparticles, then you can go even down to like a medium size of nine nanometers size. And with that, we can really then um, do our functionalized markers and do the imaging if we couple such nanoparticles to the markers that have been identified in the project. So let me come to some potential outcomes and added values that we want to generate with imprint. So we want to have a improved radiation protection for breast cancer patients. <clears throat> we will try to achieve that by better characterization of breast cancer patients, which would then also allow to advance personalized breast cancer medicine. We would like to do a high resolution 3D quantitative imaging in vivo. 
with that aiding to understand the mechanisms driving heterogeneity and immunological interactions, as well as the individual radiation sensitivity. We are certainly looking forward to connect with other projects from Piano Forte, and you already saw, I think, in this uh, session where we have a lot of connections. There's obviously imageomics, but also other projects uh, on, on therapy where we are uh, definitely dedicated to and, and would like to, to work together. Um, we uh, see improved tools for monitoring disease and guiding individualized uh, treatment decisions for improved benefit risk ratios. Um, the imaging assistant optimization of individualized and novel therapies is uh, important, I think, and uh, that includes radiation therapy and combinatorial approaches. The long term perspective and goal is certainly to have a European wide integration of the method and tools into clinical routine. Uh, but that will certainly need a lot of uh, cohorts then to do the <laughs> uh, really testing. But we first have to develop it. Therefore, we need clinical implementation strategies, commercialization of the technologies of uh, involving diagnostic and therapeutic nanotechnologies is very important there. Uh, and that includes detector technologies, DFI and XFI technologies. And for the strategies for clinical transfer and translation tasks, will be developed already within imprint, so strong links of the consortium member with clinical group for post-project implementation, collaboration within imprint and related projects will foster integration of diverse EU-wide perspectives and industry engagement in various EU member states is important. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christophe. Any question? Francois, you have four questions. <laughs> Everybody's looking for coffee. <laughs> um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so you were mentioning um, heterogeneity, but that can be on different levels. That depends on the properties of the nanoparticles. Uh, well, that for sure. Uh, for for the uh, we will. Uh, I mean, it depends on the markers to which we bound the nanoparticles. Yeah. The size of the nanoparticles is just. Uh, relevant in that sense that uh, the smaller the nanoparticles the better they go into certain cells but on the other hand um, the we need a certain load on nanoparticle mass mm -hmm. to detect it mm -hmm. uh, what level of heterogeneity we will detect is uh, more the task of the imageomics project than than our project here we need to to show first how to optimize the procedures and we have the nanoparticle production here to be able to, to show that we can do on various, um, let's say, sizes. And will the nanoparticles will be injected locally or no? So it will be... Uh, typically will be intravenous in a, in a, uh, or in, into the tail of a mice or intravenously into the uh, human being later on. But uh, for the... For the uh, Organoids, we will uh, certainly have them in the in the. Um, I'm missing the word. Sorry. Um, if you the the um, metabolite or the the um, the stuff that you give the cells to grow. <laughs> oh, they, okay, yeah. and then they. Yeah, the medium. the medium. Sorry, <laughs> I, sometimes it's too late or too early. <laughs> okay. No more questions? So I, I think we need a good break. So <laughs> let's start the second part of uh, this morning uh, session. So we will move to topic three uh, project and uh, we'll start with the project. I don't know how to pronounce it. Radio. Ra Radio. Yes. And so Pascal, <laughs> the floor is yours. So, good morning. Uh, I apologize, but uh, I have new glasses, so I cannot see as I have on the screen, so I will, I will stay here. Uh, I apologize also that uh, for your brains, because we are moving from uh, microdosimetry on nanoparticles to macrosystemic and societal problems to solve. So, could be uh, another word. Uh, so, the uh, radio project. Uh, the acronym of radio means that uh, resilience to radiological events in wartime. 
it's not an easy topic, uh, but it's a very challenging one at the, in the current situation. So the, the overall objective of RADIO is to enhance uh, nuclear emergency preparedness response and recovery systems by developing methodological and uh, technological approaches to strengthen the resilience in the context of nuclear uh, of nuclear site affected uh, by armed conflicts or war and disaster war. So uh, just a few words about the definition we have used uh, to define resilience in the project. Uh, we have uh, used the definition that has been proposed by the United Nations uh, Committee on Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, which consists in uh, its capacity, the resilience is the capacity to resist, uh, absorb, accommodate, adapt to, transform, and recover from the effects of a radiological emergency. Uh, in a timely and effective manner. So this is the main topic uh, of the of the project is to, to characterize the, the resilience and to try to to develop some uh, approaches and tools that would help to to to, to improve the resilience in case of uh, nuclear or of, of the war or harm conflict. Uh, we are convinced that uh, we need to devote time to this to topic right now, especially in the current context uh, in uh, Ukraine. So I have to to mention the the, the consortium members. I have to. I see. I see. There is a problem. We'll begin. <laughs> because it doesn't work. I hope that's working. So we are 14 partners in the project. The total budget is uh, close to one to five million. Uh, from north to south, uh, we have the University of uh, Life Science uh, in Norway uh, participating, the Lund University in Sweden, the Health Security Agency in the UKHSA in the United Kingdom, and the Kalsu Institute of Technology in Germany, and the Nuclear Research Center, and the University of Hamburg in Belgium, the University of South Bohemia in Czech Republic, the Institute for Safety Problems of Nuclear Power Plants, and the Research Center for Radiation Medicine in Ukraine. As I mentioned uh, already, in France, uh, CPN and IOSN participating, as well as the Fire Officer Academy, and in Portugal, the Environment Agency and the Research Center for Energy, Environmental and Technology in Spain, EMAT. So, as you can see, it's a multidisciplinary uh, team with involvement of uh, different uh, uh, disciplines: health physicists, nuclear physicists. Uh, radiation safety officers, uh, we have social scientists, a lot uh, participating to the project, communication specialists, radiobiologists, philosophers, ethicists, responders, including firefighters, and uh, we have also uh, connections uh, that have been established uh, with the military and uh, people. Even if they do not uh, uh, participate as members of the consortium, they will be uh, participating in what we call the project stakeholder group, the Pro is the POG, uh, in which we intend to to invite uh, different uh, specialists and experts from different bodies at the international and national levels. Uh, I mean, IAEA, ICRP, WHO, and the different army, national armies, uh, and as well the members of uh, share and nearest platforms, the SAB, uh, the pianoforte SAB. And uh, stakeholders, uh, kind of the stakeholders will be also approached to, to, to participate to the stakeholder group, to the project stakeholder group. The role of the project stakeholder group will be to advise us uh, all along the project at a different uh, level, uh, not only uh, when we will perform the, the task, but also uh, when we will elaborate the final recommendations uh, uh, at the end of the project. Uh, we also have to elaborate, uh, to establish some collaboration with uh, Japan and uh, Balkan countries, especially uh, Bosnia and Croatia, uh, where we intend to, to run uh, different case studies and surveys. They are not members, but uh, we have a small budget uh, to, to, 
to uh, operate these uh, case studies in these countries. And we also have some collaboration already established with uh, universities in Japan that will uh, help us to, to, to conduct this uh, survey. So the starting point and the objective of uh, our project is that uh, you know that we have a war in Europe uh, at the moment, and uh, we have a lot of nuclear facilities and contaminated sites uh, that are under threat or even under attack uh, at the moment. Uh, maybe you have heard about uh, the warning that has been made by the IEA, uh, head of the IEA recently, Mr. Bossi. Uh, saying that uh, it is a real threat uh, and a real concern for the agency at the moment. So the existing, we, we also observe that the existing studies on the uh, radio, radiation protection guidelines have not yet taken account the context of armed conflicts, uh, although there are a lot of uh, radio, radiation, radiation protection challenges, uh, including the lack of uh, legal frameworks, uh, limited access to affected areas in case of a conflict, Possible damages to infrastructures, including hospitals. Uh, we have the problem of a limited uh, number of trained personnel and a limited number of uh, available equipment in case of uh, uh, conflict. We have also difficulties to assess uh, the radiation protection, the radiation exposures, uh, and uh, difficulties in maintaining the capability of monitoring in case of conflict. We have the problem of disruption on, in, in, on barriers in communication. And we also have the, for recovery phase, we have the problem of the lot of lost sources and destroyed sources, radioactive sources. Furthermore, the safety and well being of the population will be uh, compromised by the ongoing hostilities, and it will make it difficult to identify and prioritize the countermeasures. Um, so we, we concluded that uh, there was a strong need to better understand the robustness of the existing principles that govern the radiation protection and EPR and our emergency preparedness response and recovery strategies in the context of armed conflict or war. So we will try to identify the needed amendments in the guidance uh, that exist and to enhance the resilience. <coughs> we have uh, five, uh, six, six uh, work packages including the work package zero, which is a coordination led by CPM, myself. Uh, the work package zero is in charge of elaborating a uh, website, uh, el elaborating a data management plan, um, communication and dissemination plan, and to constitute the project stakeholder group I have mentioned already. So these activities will be uh, probably uh, done uh, in connection with uh, Pierre Forte, uh, Data management plan and communication and dissemination plan. We will have to, to work uh, with the piano forte uh, instances on this issue. Uh, work package one uh, is in charge of the elaboration of uh, scenarios leading to radiological consequences in case of an armed conflict or war. Uh, it is led by the Institute of Safety Problems of Nuclear Power Plants in Ukraine. The work package two is led by the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. And they, they are in charge of uh, characterizing the resilience. Uh, that means that they have to identify all the dimension of some indicators that could be used to develop what they call an in analytical platform, it's kind of a tool that could be implemented in the, in, in the decision support systems. It's based on uh, agent based modeling, uh, if you know, uh, it's based on. Uh, the development of uh, algorithms that helps the decision makers to take decisions uh, in a uh, very short time. Uh, RSN will, led, uh, will lead the work package three, uh, which consists in uh, elaborating case studies in different uh, horizons and different uh, parts of the world. Uh, there are four uh, topics, main topics uh, we will uh, uh, look at the resilience at the level of uh, the first line responders. That's the reason why we have involved uh, the Firefighter Academy of Office, uh, Office, Firefighter Officer Academy in France, but we will also have contact with the firefighters in the Republic. We will also explore the resilience of authority uh, in general, the resilience of NGO who are involved in the, in the conflict. And uh, for instance, uh, across uh, 
or different uh, responders, ex responders, and we also explore the local community. So this is will be done uh, in different countries, uh, one topic for each country or two topics for each country in Ukraine, Czech Republic. Uh, we involve we we will we will intend to have uh, surveys on, in Balkan countries, especially uh, in linked with uh, former Yugoslavia wars, uh, and we will also have a case study in Japan uh, exploring uh, the similarities between uh, the post, post uh, Fukushima accident catastrophe uh, in Minamisoma city, where uh, there was a disruption of uh, of all the uh, infrastructures after the the catastrophe. The work package four uh, is uh, mainly uh, as will mainly elaborate the final recommendation, but uh, we also have in this work package, which is led by an MBU in Norway, uh, the realization of scenario exercises and also the design of a training course for responders and the decision makers. We will not make the training course themselves. That was why I asked the question uh, yesterday about the, the possibility to run a training course, but at the moment uh, in the project, we just have, we just intend to develop material and uh, uh, maybe we, we will perform some training course if we have um, uh, the budget to do that. The last uh, project, the last work package, uh, which is led by the University of South Bahia, is uh, on the vertical challenges and the other cross-cutting issues, and we will have uh, some activities uh, linked with this, uh, especially we'll organize a uh, workshop on the ethical challenges. So you can see here on the key milestones uh, of the radio project that uh, we intend to start the project uh, the 1st of February next year. It will last uh, 30 months uh, to end in uh, 2026 by the end of July. Uh, so the kickoff meeting will uh, be in France uh, in February. We hope to have the project stakeholder group constituted uh, the first year. Uh, the workshop on ethical challenges, uh, the first will occur also the, by the end of 2024. Uh, we intend to have the matrix developed uh, next year in 2025. We will uh, organize two dissemination workshops uh, the first year and the second year. The forecast will be uh, around uh, 2025 uh, in Ukraine, Czech uh, Republic, Balkan, and Japan by four different teams. Uh, we will have the training material developed uh, by the end of the project the last year, and also the scenario exercises, the resilience analytical uh, platform, and the final workshop. If you look at the time, Agenda. We we as we have the the end of the project in 2026, which means that it is 40 years after the Chernobyl accident. It is planned at the moment that the final workshop will be organized in Ukraine. Uh, so we have some uh, risk uh, on this. Uh, you can imagine. So if uh, if it's not possible uh, because of uh, the circumstances, uh, we will have a plan B, uh, probably in Czech Republic or, or, or elsewhere. We, we don't know at the moment. But we hope that the, the end of uh, the war uh, will occur before as the end of the work, the, the, the project. So we, we still uh, expect to have this uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, either in Chernobyl, because one of the members I see it is in Chernobyl. I should say short Chernobyl, as my uh, Ukrainian colleague asked us to, to use. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have uh, other deliverables which are expected uh, in the project. We have four, we have four topical uh, PhD that will uh, be uh, participated to the project. I mean that there is one on environmental remediation of contaminated sites. There is one on uh, optical, optically simulated luminescence for retrospective and prospective dosimetry uh, after radiological, radiological emergency led by the University of Lund. Uh, NMBU will also involve one PhD, but I don't know the topic. Uh, maybe 
Deborah, you could say if, uh, if you know more than me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there is also one uh, on social science uh, activity on uh, social media analysis uh, uh, that will be uh, involved in the, in the project. So as deliverable, you also have the decision editing tools and the techniques, decision editing tools that we want to develop and the training material for decision makers and responders. And uh, the final report uh, with a set of uh, recommendations that will cover different topics, such as uh, how to evacuate, should we evacuate, uh, should, how should we shelter the population in case of an armed conflict and with radical consequences, how to maintain or to organize the uh, hiding inside, uh, blocking, uh, Pills distribution, if it's possible or not, uh, should we recommend to, to take some iodine or not? Uh, what kind of restrictions should be maintained or proposed in case of uh, armed conflict with radical consequences? Because sometimes it's not uh, compatible with what is in the existing plan. Mm -hmm. We will also propose a methodology to build scenarios. Uh, how to model the situation, how to monitor the, the, the radiological, radiological consequences uh, uh, without uh, the form of capabilities, and how to make a dosimetry and retrospective dosimetry. We will also propose some uh, advice uh, on uh, which countermeasures should be implemented and which uh, recovery strategies should be still valid and how to engage stakeholders mm -hmm. in the remediation or in the characterization of the situation. And we will also propose some ethical uh, solutions. The final uh, output of the project uh, is to better understand and improve the resilience and uh, capacities in case of war or armed conflicts. That's it. Thank you. Any question? Yes. So I have the question. So the project is a very ambitious. Yeah. But please let me know how do you plan to to meet the, all your objectives? That's a scenario, war scenario development, the, the first responders uh, preparation. When you have no in your team, uh, neither the Baltic countries, neither Poland, nor uh, Romania and Slovakia. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mean that uh, we need to have the neighbor countries? Uh, from yes, so those, those countries yeah. are just next, the, yeah. first, the first which will be exposed to that yeah, yes. in which case of the country. So the, the idea is to have one case study in Czech Republic, which is not that close if you, <laughs> if you, if you, if you want. And uh, so we also take the experience. The idea is not to, to improve the resilience because of the war in Russia. It is more uh, the war in Ukraine by Russia, the invasion by, by Russia. Uh, I mean that the idea is to be more general. That's the, that's the reason why we, we intend to have some case studies in other countries, for instance, in Balkan countries. And that's true that we do not have, at the moment, partners in these countries, but we already have taken some contacts with, uh, with them. So we have the insurance, I, would, I do not say that insurance, but we have the good willing, uh, good hope that they will help us to organize some surveys and uh, some feedback uh, from this country after the, for, from the Yugoslavia wars and also uh, from the situation which is close uh, to a chaotic situation in a, in a war uh, with the Japanese colleagues uh, in Minamisoma. We have already taken contacts to see how to deal with this situation uh, which is totally chaotic and uh, how to organize things and to, to improve the emergency preparedness and response and recovery in that field. Uh, in that. So, but we are limited by the number of participants. I agree. Uh, we could have a bit more partners or more partners, but uh, it's possible. Okay. Okay. Pardon? And one thing which um, I, I think there is actually rather little done on in potential military scenarios is actually not just pure radiation, but actually the mixture of radiation and chemical contamination. And it's actually quite rare in military scenario, uh, apart from somebody setting off an enormous uh, nuclear device, um, that actually you don't have a mixture of multi-stressors. 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yes, uh, we, we should we should we should transmit this message to those who are in charge of elaborating the scenarios. It's interesting to have uh, to have this mixing. Uh, um, Multiple risk uh, scenarios in the in the in the score. I think that's all right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I agree with that. So it, it can be one of the factors um, characterizing the scenario. The matrix at the moment, I don't have the attributes of the matrix, but you you could have also these, these chemical aspects or the other risk as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Pascal. Okay, so with next uh, presentation is uh, Project uh, City Spa and the money that we make with the recovery to school. Good morning. I hope that with uh, the presentation, it, you will see that there are complementary projects with the uh, presentation and it will give us the Eastern countries uh, which were not. Uh, participating in the previous project. So, CITISRA is abbreviation of citizen measurements as complementary radiation monitoring strategy in threats due to armed conflict or natural disasters. I am presenting uh, the project on behalf of my colleague Jan Hellebrand, who is the project coordinator from National Radiation Protection Institute, and he's working in the Department of Emergency Preparedness, and we all work on citizen measurements uh, at the national level and uh, the proposed project that uh, uh, we uh, we propose to piano for the first call is re is uh, enlarging our activities in that domain as this it is reaction to current uh, political situation in europe and to basically the whole world uh, if we look the news and we would like to evaluate feasibility of uh, and possibilities of employment citizen measurements in uh, as a complementary tool for uh, monitoring radiation in uh, uh, in the uh, at, uh, yeah involved in the uh, uh, countries uh, the, uh, the research consortium uh, involves Czech Republic Slovakia and Poland and uh, as a force uh, institution, I didn't, uh, yeah, my colleague Dan Topjig, uh, who is from for Poland and Institute of Nuclear Physics uh, from Krakow, who is affiliated and collaborating with uh, this institute. So uh, these uh, measurements uh, are already, we already have some experiences and we want to uh, extend uh, these studies to really assess and improve data quality and train uh, and support uh, these people. And of course, uh, the strong part of the project are social aspects of that. And uh, I will speak about them a little bit later. So um, based on our experiences with the safe casts, which were developed in Japan after Fukushima accidents, that we have about 60 pieces and we do already uh, uh, some, some trials uh, in the Czech Republic with them. And also, uh, we uh, sent uh, several pieces last year to Ukraine, and you can you can check the uh, safecast or map and to check the measurements uh, uh, made by this safecast in Chernobyl and Ukraine by non-governmental bodies, which is really the, the proof that it can be possibly used and applied in very uh, special scenarios when the standard uh, bodies and uh, system of monitoring uh, fails or it's not uh, it's uh, really influenced by external conditions and that uh, that the civil citizen measurements can be used not to replace to complement this is what i would like to underline based on uh, our experiences with safecasts we developed a modified version which is called check rat detectors and uh, we will have thousands of these detectors in the Czech Republic. And we will, in the frame of the project, we will be, uh, build uh, and assemble another 300. 200 of them will go to Poland and 100 will go to Slovakia. And uh, uh, as you can see from the model, I don't have such a complicated model as uh, my colleague, <laughs> but uh, I would like to say that uh, we, uh, we uh, want to 
select groups of citizens, not randomly, but basically based on some on some uh, rules that uh, that uh, I will also mention and uh, provide them with the, the train them and provide them with the, them the, uh, the detectors and to ask them to do measurements and to evaluate the, the risk uh, perception of the public before and after when they have availability to perform their own measurements. So these groups uh, should be selected or what we would like to select them as a trusted groups of people, some like semi-organized. So we consider uh, uh, ambulance crews, uh, we consider volunteer firemen, scouts, uh, even doctors, because in Japan, the most trusted group of people were local, local general doctors that people were going to ask them about the risk. So all these groups can be uh, uh, can be uh, selected. And this is definitely not sure that it, there will be the same in these countries. So this is what we want also to target during the first year by soci sociological survey to really to, uh, to, de to determine in these countries which are close uh, but by cultural habits, but they have different legal uh, background and uh, of course the situation and the feeling of the Ukrainian war is different and they feel, yeah, they have some differences. So in with respect to these differences, really to, to find such groups which will be trained and equipped with the detectors and to perform the measurements. So uh, this is the uh, simple scheme. So the first year we will produce the detectors and we uh, will perform sociological survey uh, where we will prepare these suitable users in all three countries and we will prepare materials how to inform them and train them. So we will select several detectors in before they will they will be really distributed the whole number uh, to be to be prepared to do measurements in the second and third year. And the data that they will acquire uh, will go back to some trained person. And these can be basically to the model here. Then they can be transferred. Uh -huh. To data checking processing center and to go to radiation protection authority if necessary with the, uh, uh, with all knowledge about the uncertainties and precisions and, and all these uh, limitations of the measurements. But on the, as the other point is that the, the local people will have really possibility to have data with, with, without respect to any monitoring system and internet in case of blackout or, or information uh, lack. Uh, so they will, they will have possibility to check the local situation at, at the given moment regardless of the scenario that it can come. So after the first year, we should be ready to distribute the detectors to, uh, to start uh, measurements because the users will have possibility to check the measurements uh, on site, uh, download them on the notebook. There will not be, as in case of Safecast, uh, send uh, online directly somewhere to the database, but they will see them locally and then they will be sent to some uh, trained person dosimetrist who will be able to really assess the, the, the valuability of the, uh, of the results. Um, in addition, there is another thing. We will uh, check possibilities to use these detectors for uh, fast measurement and scan of scenario glands and also food and feedstock and objects of daily use in case of some local contamin contamination. So the structure of the project uh, goes the, uh, into four work packages, regardless of the uh, last work package, which is management. Um, so uh, each partner is responsible for, uh, for one of work packages, Suro, Korean, uh, uh, without glasses. So the first uh, target citizen groups uh, goes for uh, Slovak uh, University, like citizen science is the uh, work package, uh, or everything technical regarding uh, check rat detectors, uh, uh, it's uh, going to for Suro. 
and analysis of monitoring strategies will be led by uh, uh, Nuclear Physics Institute in Krakow. So what will be expected as results are publicly available radiation measurement data for powder used by everybody who will be interested. Uh, public report of uh, sociological surveys, which will be performed here before and afterwards, as I said, and uh, possibilities of citizen measurements in monitoring of thyroid food and uh, other objects of daily life. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Be first before getting the trusted groups to train our domestic <laughs> members. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. Any question? Yes. Well, um, in uh, this uh, radiation detector, um, uh, your uh, which uh, measurement quantity are you measuring? It's Geiger Miller, and it will be a uh, yeah, very precise uh, uh, dose range, basically. It is uh, a pancake uh, detector inside. Ba ba pan pancake. 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 Uh, no, the, no, there is Geiger Miller. Yeah, Geiger Miller pancake detector. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the yeah. And uh, why did you choose this one uh, instead of maybe uh, H star 10 compensated cube? Uh, I said this is the, the thing that you should ask Le Jan uh, for exactly because it allows to do measurements of different uh, quantities. Yeah, the the thing is why. Uh, why they developed Chektrat was uh, uh, the robustness, the availability of uh, of components because they are all uh, local or uh, independent of uh, uh, or easily uh, reachable, and that we can assemble them uh, ourselves with our resources, and uh, that it's not uh, automatically sent. The data are not automatically sent somewhere, but in principle there should be. Yeah, locally people can watch that. Uh, but uh, for some international or uh, wider wider dissemination, there will be checked by uh, some uh, somebody experiment. So, so it will probably uh, show uh, pounds per second, and it will use yeah. it will use as a radiation indicator or something. Yeah, sort. it will be detector, not dosimeter. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You? Me? Yeah. Thank you. Because training on all of these people is very ambitious, and also I keep this knowledge for the public. I have a question: How will you assure that you will always get the data? For example, internet is not working. Do you have any other plans how this data will be provided? I suppose that the training will be during the peace and not war. <laughs> the first. And the, the group will, will consist in Poland of 200 people, basically, and 100 in, in Slovakia. So we envisage uh, groups by 20, 30 people that they will come or somebody will go there to group the people and train them. And we also plan to do some uh, sometimes measurements that we take them to hotspots at the national level that they can really measure in. Uh, outside uh, to see really the, the responses. And this can be also outcome that, uh, okay, rescuers in ambulances is fine because they can drive, they do, they can perform measurements on the road when driving the whole day, but uh, that uh, they will not be available, they will not be able to send data on a daily basis because they are busy or so. So all this should will be evaluated and assessed. Mr. <laughs> I mean, uh, thanks. I was wondering, I mean, in, in times of war, probably people won't have these detectors on hand, right? Only the 300 or something like that. So, um, do you plan to compare it with things that people will have on hand, like their smartphones and uh, stuff like that? Not within this project. Uh, uh, we uh, what was the plan was really like complementary to have some semi-organized group of people. The volunteer firefighters is the case. They are basically in the Czech Republic and Slovakia in every small village. And they are they have the contact. So so this is uh, we are not going to train the whole public, the whole country, but we will ask people, do you know that your neighbor 
that you have possibility either to borrow the detector from them or to ask them to come to do measurement for you that there is somebody in your neighbor neighborhood and uh, that uh, you you can somehow control your situation this is uh, this is the point yeah i think it, it's and, nice but the question is can we need you to, i mean most people will have smartphones things like that if, if there's something that that's workable and we know there are some possibilities could you not have them these 300 also be trained on on that and then have a comparison that that would be nice because in case of an emergency you won't send around check around detectors i think that, that will be already there we, we expect to to let to let them distribute it or to borrow them uh the long term uh the, the thing is of course that uh, the, you are right for uh mobile phone the the uh, advantage of chestnuts and safe uh, safe cast is that they have this max. So when the internet is working, people can can get uh, at international level the information about the situation. For mobile phones, uh, I'm not sure that the open radiation it works. We we contacted the and they were not they they didn't they were not interested to join with the the last last year the situation was not simple. So so the uh, they uh, decided not to join the, the program, but we would like to, mm -hmm. to collaborate with them. And uh, this is also a possibility to use the cell phone, but it means, yeah, extended work to the materials and explain how to do, do the measurements correctly. Yeah. Yeah. As, as correct as possible. And you want to give just. Uh... Coming back to, to, to your project, I think that there are some connections that could be uh, made with ours, uh, especially we are a citizen group in Ukraine, and uh, the role of the citizen group in Ukraine we have is only to, to test the possibility to, to use uh, table salt uh, SL or dosimeters, so it's not really uh, engaging uh, the people, uh, and I think that if we could also distribute some safe cast or, or Dosimeter and this as the same group could be helpful for your project. We can speak about so that. We can speak yeah. uh, up here. And to answer to Christoph, maybe uh, the, the threat phase is longer in, in, in during uh, an armed conflict. So you have time to distribute uh, that kind also, of uh, dosimeter. Uh, yeah. Because uh, it is not the same as an accident. Uh, you have sometimes the threat phase lasts one year or more. So if uh, you have uh, identified the population which is at risk, you can distribute this kind of. This is what happened last year that uh, the war started in February, and they, the local people, the Ukrainians were not. Uh, yeah, they were saying, "Oh, we are not, uh, we are not getting information from the government. They, they are afraid of public reaction, so not all information are avail available. So we were, we borrowed uh, several safe cars. They are still at the. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, doing uh, performing measurements, it was a uh, Chernobyl uh, problem at the moment. Uh, so they did measurements, and now we have even fixed stations doing measurements. Uh, I think there are five uh, working stations there, so we can extend, of course. Michel, yes. Um, but I was wondering, is the number of detectors not a bit small to cover the region? For Poland, for Poland, we consider only the eastern part. So that for for uh, colleagues from Krakow, it's not they don't travel over the whole country, but they selected uh, to what what's called? Thank you. Others. Just two comments from the online participants. One from Jan, who is the coordinator. A short remark, the detector doesn't require any sophisticated training and it is enough sensitive to show it works even in normal background levels. And uh, Pavlo Kachenko added that they already have some safe cast in Ukraine from Shuro and they have a small network of people who are doing measurements. Maybe you mentioned it by like, uh, sorry, that I, I was in the same. Yeah. And you can find a link for technical details about the detector online if you want. Yeah, the, yeah, we have on a wiki uh, uh, details, so you can you can get the links, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. So now the very last presentation, uh, predict project. Ooh. Yep, that's uh, it's Clemens Moda, and he can yes. done. So it will be online. It will be online. Uh, Clemens, can you hear us, and can you?
Yes. Can you hear your I, screen or do you see any problem? I can hear you. Uh, I can hear you if you can see, if you can hear me. No, we can hear you. Sorry, I just switch on the speaker and please wait a bit. Okay, so, uh, oh, I have to, yes, sorry, I have to share my screen. <laughs> That is the challenge now with Teams. Um, okay. I'm, I I used to do this with WebEx, I'm very familiar. It's next to the leave button on the top right corner. I'm not sure that you can immediately share, but if you cannot, then I try to do something. I'm working on it. Uh, kind of, I'm missing that button. I'm sorry. Uh, still, it should be next to the. Make him call. Um, so, um, what is it called? Manager. Yeah. You really need to assign him. At all. Yeah, I, okay, that could be it. Um, Moment, please. Do I need to hang up again? Mm -hmm. Yes. No. Can you try it again? If you share your screen. So next to the leave button, do you see a share button? No, I see just uh, show the participants button, show the the. Uh, okay, sorry. Now I made you a present, and now you should see the share button. <clears throat> we have to refresh something. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm That's sorry. Um, uh. Yep, but it's still not there. Okay, then um, I will share your maybe, slides. Yeah, let, but maybe we have to do that. I'm sorry. Um, no, I should change fine. the slides a little bit, but I'll, I'll just ready. say next slide then. No, no, it's uh, ready. 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 Okay, yeah. Can I see the slides? Oh, yeah, I think. Great. Then I have to share the screen. Okay, there we go. Moment, Thank for you. Moment please. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay, we can start and I will. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I cannot scroll though, I'll just say next slide, right? Yeah. Okay. So I apologize, I really would have liked to be there, but uh, due to the heavy snowfalls, all trains yesterday between Munich and Budapest were canceled. There was just no chance. So I'm going to give you a short, um, being the last speaker and we're a bit behind time, I'll try to make this um, short and sweet. Um, this is one project where at least the acronym is easy to pronounce. I hope, uh, next slide, please. So what, what it is about, um, PREDICT aims to enable the major international used decision support systems like, such as J. Rodos and Argos, but also other national used atmospheric dispersion models and the food chain models to simulate and predict consequences due to the fallout of a nuclear detonation in Europe or worldwide. Um, the project should last for 36 months. Uh, we have 12 partners from seven countries. You can see on the right-hand side, I'm not gonna go through all the list here. Um, we're a bit biased towards the Scandinavian countries. They're more active in this area. Um, and you can see that requested funding is about a third of the total project costs because we have like partners from Norway and UK uh, participating on their own costs because they thought they still they wanted to be a part of this because they thought this project to be highly relevant. Um, so this is uh, good for the whole consortium. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we heard this several times already. We would not be talking about these kind of projects if it weren't for the events that ha started last year in February. And in particular for our project, the repeated threat by Russia to use tactical nuclear weapons in the war against Ukraine. Um, if the, the event of the war turns in an unfavorable or catastrophic way for Russia. 
So this stresses the necessity of European countries to be prepared and to be able to respond to a nuclear detonation scenario. Now, from a radiological point of view, there's little that you can do in the immediate blast zone where we have mass destruction and mass casualties, but considerable contamination may also occur far beyond the battlefront zone due to the nuclear fallout. And it is there where radiation protection of the public could significantly help reduce stochastic and deterministic health effects if initiated in a timely manner if it's already in place. The problem is we do have these decision support systems that are currently used in Europe, but they were prim primarily developed for responding to nuclear power plant accidents. <coughs> and similar also our protective action strategies and our communication strategy strategies to the public. But the response to a nuclear detonation is in many ways different and poses specific challenges for any decision support system and strategies that must be met. Next slide, please. So the project sector, our mission statement is what we wanna do is at the end, improve the operational capabilities of the models used in Europe so that the European member states can make sound decisions on the protection of the population from nuclear detonations. We structured the, uh, the project into six work packages and there are three more technical work packages, one about uh, protective action strategies and one about training. So first, the three more technical work package. The one is about the source term, which is the most relevant parameter when you want to do any uh, atmospheric dispersion modeling. Here it is about the research into the relevant parameter data sets that we need. What is relevant for atmospheric dispersion modeling for either an air burst and a ground detonation? On the right-hand side, you can see an example of both. The top is, an, is a ground detonation from a nuclear test. And the, the bottom uh, picture is actually the Nagasaki bomb. And you can see we're a difference between how much, how, how the dust, how the dirt, debris, something is sucked into, into the entire mushroom cloud for, for ground detonation. And, and they have a, an air gap between the stem and the, and the mushroom cap for air burst detonation. So this will also affect the particle size distribution, activity height. The question is, what are the main dose delivering radioclides? So this is all part of work package one. And also how can we, we make the computing time more efficient? and then to develop the relevant scenarios to be used in the other work packages. Work package two is a little bit connected to that in terms of modeling improvement here. It's about that goes beyond the immediate project lifetime is to develop scientifically based recommendations for future improvements of these atmospheric dispersion and the dose assessment models in case of nuclear detonations. Um, next slide, please. Model comparison is probably the most important of the three work technical work package. Because here it's really about we have all, all the capabilities of the different partners that have some developed uh, um, efforts in this direction, but we don't know. We've never, it has never been in comparison with the different codes. So what we first want to uh, try is can we use historical contamination data from the 1950s weapon test for the model, uh, sorry, model validation as far as possible? We know this is a bit of a challenge due to the limited amount of uh, information, but we're going to try this, and this will tell us something of the accuracy of our prediction. And then the second step will be assess the uncertainty in our models using the same input parameters for all partners, but the different codes that each partner uses. And this will tell us something about the precision of the prediction, how, how, uh, how large are the uncertainty bands. And then we can say something in a true event, if there are discrepancies in the prediction in different countries, is this within the uncertainty or is this really a systematic difference? Hopefully at the end of the project, we will all be harmonized to a certain level that we all predict more or less the same. And there are two ways of doing this with these kind of yearly average meteorological conditions or the most relevant meteorological conditions. Then that sort of concludes the technical work package. And then we come to the uh, work package four, which is all about protective action strategies. Which models are good, but what, what are they used for in the end to, to you know, communicate and put into place all the protective actions? So here it is about developing these harmonized protective action strategies based on the unified source term of work package one and the specific endpoints of this uncertainty analysis in work package three, but then also develop effective ways of communicating these protective measures to the public. Um, and there also all the social scientists come in. We have these kind of experts here on board. It's not really my area, but there's a lot of uh, effects you need to take into account in these communication strategies. And this will also be elaborated in a, a workshop uh, kind of with key players in, in emergency response, response, which is kind of, I think, towards the end of the project. Ne Thank you. Next slide. You're fast. Um, and uh, work package five is all about <laughs> education, training, and dissemination. Disseminate the project results to yeah all the the emerging EPR community using the different channels where all the partners are already involved in these in the agency activities of the NEA, the Haka Venra group, 
important in this aspect is also these regular international exercises of these HODOS and Argos user groups. It's a very good opportunity. We have like 40 partners worldwide participating in these kind of exercises to distribute these the project results directly to all the relevant agencies. Of course, conferences, but also training courses through the training and education funds of Pianoforte uh, with the next PhD students and early career scientists. And finally, work package six, as with every work project needs project management. Uh, don't have to go into details of that. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, that's all. Right. Wow, you're always uh, you're anticipating this quite well. Thank you. Um, uh, so short and sweet, uh, project results and impact. A uh, very smart person once told me, if you want to get a message across to the audience, you're first going to say that you're going to say something, then you say it, and then you say it again. So this is exactly what I'm going to do now, repeat everything. What we're going to have, what do we expect at the end of the project to have updated simulation models, which will be state of the art. We're going to develop recommendations for protective actions together with strategies to disseminate them to the population based on these updated models. And important to note here is that the, all results will be implemented in these national and supranational decision support system. I mentioned it's Argos, JWADOS. There are also national systems like where the UK uses JAM, Norway, SNAP, also Sweden has their own model. Um, and through the, these training exercises, there will be these project results will all be disseminated to the, to the wider community. And we're also going to make re uh, recommendations for future research for improvement in modeling and dose assessment. Needless to say, we all hope that this kind of scenario will never ever take place anywhere in the world. And if being prepared and being able to respond helps minimize the likelihood of this ever taking place, then this effort is all worth it. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention with the last slide. Thank you. I am good in time. <laughs> thank you, Clemence, for uh, your presentation. We have time for a few questions. The room is very quiet. Ah, sorry. <laughs> I was a bit fast. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I thought you wanted to, you want to finish on time. But you presented the worrying situation, so yeah. <laughs> Pascal from the Radio <laughs> Project. Just to inform you that we have excluded the nuclear detonation scenarios from the Radio Project. But uh, as far as I understand, uh, you will also make some recommendations in terms of uh, modeling uh, or those assessment pathologies. Uh, so we should not make different recommendations if the if the the population that are target in your project are far from the from the detonation point, I mean, that uh, we could have the same problem in terms of dose, and so we should also make the recommendations that are coherent, I would say. Even if we have uh, excluded this scenario from our scope, maybe we would have some common recommendation, I don't know. What's your yeah. meaning? What's your mind? Yeah, we, we can certainly streamline these activities. I think this is easy because we, some, uh, we have uh, some same partners on board. So I think the information flow between both projects is easily guaranteed, and we certainly should um, yes, make sure that we don't give contradicting recommendations. That, that At least we have two common partners, so that would be yeah. nice to, to, to have them carry on between the two projects. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Good point. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Clemence. Uh, so it's time to close this uh, morning session that was dedicated to the presentation of the selected project. At least for me, it was very interesting. I'm not going to say that I understood everything because I am not a biologist, but uh, from the discussion uh, you had, I think that it was really a very uh, interesting session with a lot of uh, exchanges. Uh, I would like also to thank all the speakers because they were able to make a presentation with a very short uh, notice because it's only uh, two weeks ago that we announced the, the results of the first scope.